The Bible is arguably the most enigmatic book of all time. Its depth and richness of narrative, songs, poetry, law, prophecy, and eschatology is unrivaled in its class. This text confounded many for centuries, attributed to the divine inspiration of the Most High Yah, only a select few were privileged to be able to unravel the mysteries that lie beneath. Today, there are tons of academic gatekeepers who have been able to unlock this coded script using a variety of techniques, mostly unknown to laymen. However, today, this is no longer the case. Thankfully, Divine Prospect has spent 15 years playing the spook who sat by the door to gather intel on how to best approach the text and get the most objective understanding possible. He is making these techniques available to the general public in the upcoming KHM Holistic Research Paradigm for Bible Study Classes. For the first time, be able to read the text the way it was intended by the author to his immediate audience. Once you've been able to successfully decipher the scripture, you will then learn how to map it to modern times and yield a harvest of actual results. Sign up today by going to www.patreon.com backslash divine prospect and join the $50 tier to reserve your spot. Seats are extremely limited, so take advantage of this opportunity before it's too late. Peace and Shalom. The Bible is arguably the most enigmatic book of all time. It's death and richness of narrative. Okay, okay. What's going on, family? What's going on? It's your brother, Divine Prospect Kingdom Harbor Ministries. Hit one. If you can hear me loud and clear, and if you can see, the audio video is good. Hit one. If not, hit two. If so, hit one. If not, hit two. It's my little... Oh, yeah. Little harvest back there. Yeah. Some red leaf lettuce back there. <clears throat> All right, let me know. Let me know. You can you hear me? Okay. Audio and video is good. That's good. All right. Okay. Peace and Shalom, family. It's Brother Divine Prospect, Kingdom Harbor Ministries. We are back in the building. I'm going live tonight because over the weekend, I will be having some family coming in town. So I would not be able to go live on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, so I figured I'd try and hurry up and get in here and go live right now. Again, drinking more of this uh, prebiotic soda. That's... Um, Infused with apple vinegar, vinegar, uh, vinegar, immunity sidekick, prebiotics for a healthy gut, all organic ingredients, nothing artificial. This is made by Poppy. This is the dot pop uh, flavor. All right. No, it's not sponsored. I'm not getting anything for telling you that. I'm just letting you know. So in case you're looking for uh, something as an alternative to regular soda. Regular soda is not healthy for you, but if you're looking for an alternative to regular soda, this is going to be your best bet, okay? All right, so we're about to get started. Now, this particular session is on uh, Passover and the new year. So if you have any questions, you can ask it. Um, sometimes we have trolls that's lurking about. If any of the trolls want to support Easter over Passover, uh, please be my guest and let me know if you want to join in on the panel have a discussion. Um, also, we're going to be going over reckoning of time in regards to the ancient pre exilic Israelite menological sacerdotal calendar or model. Yes, I add all those deep words for a reason. Each word means something and has a purpose. So I'm sure you will understand as we progress forward through the rest of the session. But if you have any questions, let's deal with the questions. We're going to get right to it. I don't plan on being here too long. Um, however, if anybody else has um, an, in some insight or perspective in regards to the calendrical system, feel free to let me know. I'll bring you on the panel. We can have a discussion as well. Um, but I'm doing this because I know I have a lot of people every year. You know, there's new people to this channel and all there's new people to the truth that ask me, how do I reckon time according to the ancient Israelite calendar? Um, why is this calendar different from this calendar? 
and etc. So I want to be able to answer those questions. Sometimes they say, hey, when is Passover? Why is it like five, six different dates for Passover? You know, what is your date for Passover? How do you calculate that, etc.? Those of you who the OG's been here for a long time, my day ones, you already know what time it is. However, there's always new people that are coming on in, and I want to make sure that we're mindful of them and that we can educate them and inform them so that way they have confidence in where they stand in regards to keeping Yah's feast days. And I'm going to say this for the record. Whatever your reckoning of time it is and your personal disposition, I have no beef with it, right? Um, as long as you're keeping Yah's feast days, all praise to the Most High, right? We always present what our perspective is on here, and there's people that disagree with it or see differently, and this is an opportunity for us to discuss it and um, see where the questions are going to be, all right, where they're going to fall, all right? Hold on one second. All right. Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> so here's the link right here. I'm going to give a couple of shout outs in a moment. All right. Let's go from the top. Shalom to Antoinette Clark. Uh, Yaramaya, Banya Sharala. Shalom, get wise. Shalom, Nazarene of the way. Shalom, righteous scale. Shalom, Ace A. Shalom, Gavin Miller. Shalom, unknown L. Shalom. Yoel Ben Yisrael, Shalom. Tony Yaya Sharala, Shalom. Damon Williamson, Shalom. Eli Madkins, Shalom. Um, let's see. Jay Wallace, Shalom. Frank Gaither Jr., Shalom. Shalom, my brother, what's going on? Vaughn Parker in the building, Shalom. Uh, Emmanuel, Shalom. Uh, let's see. Asantua, Shalom. Uh, David and Sister Gail, Shalom, family. What's going on? We're keeping it at a buck. Uh, TG Productions, I would like to be on the panel to ask questions. Sure, I dropped the link in the chat for you. No problem. Uh, shout out to Thea P, AJ, Yahoo, Eli Elihu, uh, excuse me, Elihu or Elihu, Yahoo, uh, Ahu, Shalom, Aishu Cole, Shalom. Let me see. Let me see. Is that everybody? Everybody? All right. If you want to shout out, just hit one. If you want to shout out, just hit one. Let me know. Okay, again, this is dedicated specifically to the feast days. Um, hold on one second. Let me see. Let me see why my speakers are not working. What's going on? Let's see. Hold on one second. Let me see. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so feel free to ask questions as we go through the session. Um, if you have questions, if you want to join the panel, if you want to defend Easter, or if you want to share some perspective or ask questions or comments and you uh, are willing to come on the panel, feel free to do so as well, okay? All right. <clears throat> All right, so I have Tyrone Gold. Am I saying that right? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, I can't. I cannot hear you. Let me see. What is going on? Why can I not hear you? Is this tab muted? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. Are you there? Yes, I can hear you. What's going on, my brother? Shalom, brother. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Shalom, shalom. Yes, sir. I've been. Uh, I actually been meaning to get in contact with. I get, but we could we could talk about that later. I want to ask about the uh, the feast days since that's what this live is dedicated to. Okay. Uh, I noticed that there's a couple reasons why people have different, um, you know, feast days or how they start or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, usually, it's based off of what they're 
believing the new moon is um, in the scriptures. So I would just like to present just like a brief overview because I'm driving right now. I don't, I don't okay. uh, have the scriptures in front of me, but I know them book, chapter, verse okay. uh, to present what I guess I adhere to at the moment. And I just would like for you to critique it for a second. Okay. Uh, it's actually funny enough. You're, you're celebrating Passover April 8th, right? Uh, yes, that's the official day. Gotcha. So it, we actually landed on the same day that we're doing Passover, um, the way I calculated, but I know it's probably not as, uh, it's probably not as precise as, as your breakdown is. That's why I'm asking you to critique it as a moray and as an elder. Yeah, so, no, 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 no doubt, my brother. Sure, you got the floor. So the way I see it is the full moon um, is what would classify as the, the new moon. And the reason why I subscribe to that is uh, when I read Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, uh, chapter 43, as it's describing the glory of the moon, it, it does say that's a sign of feast and the month is called after her name. Um, and the way it's describing it is from the perspective of also, when we look at Genesis 16, it tells us that he made the, the moon to rule over the night. And when he created the moon, I believe when he created it, uh, he said he made two great lights. And I would believe that when he created the moon at first, it was a full moon. Uh, and with that being said, I, that's how I see what a full moon is of the first of the month. Or it'll be the first night, I guess, and then the following day would be the first day of the month, and then I would count my days from that point. Um, and as far as the new year, I typically just go with the the third or the third new moon, the third full moon, um, in the Greco-Roman calendar because usually that's around the time where spring is coming in. Um, but I know that that's not as concise of an argument because that I'm really relying on the Gregorian calendar and the third full moon of the Gregorian calendar year to base the beginning of a Hebrew calendar year. And so I'm looking for kind of critique on really all of that, but especially that portion of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, you're using Ecclesiasticus, um, and the reference was talking about the moon being full, um, in reference to the month, so that being the new moon, we in accordance with that. Um, I would, I can also use Ecclesiasticus as well, uh, from the Apocrypha, um, as a medium. I'm gonna mute you real quick because it's some feedback. Um, so I can also use, um, that as well. Um, oh, there we go. Um, I can also use that as well, uh, because again, that reference in particular does talk about the full moon being the new moon. Um, there's several other references that can be used to say the full moon is the new moon. I know IUIC back in 2016, um, they came out with the new moon being the full moon as well. They use the book of Ecclesiasticus from the Apocrypha, and they use, uh, I think, two other scriptures that I'm mistaken to co witness with that. Um, I did a presentation back in, when did I do that? Back in June or July, I did a whole lecture series in regards to the calendar. It was actually over seven hours. It's three parts of it over seven hours. I try not to leave no stone unturned. However, it was still an abridged version because there's so much information to unpack in regards to that. Um, and now when I teach it, I try to find a way to simplify it, right? So it's easier to grasp than having to watch seven plus hours. Um, but yes, I, I agree with that in regards to, to full moon being a new moon. There are other references as well in scripture, like Psalm 81 and 3, that can be a reference to either the new moon being the full moon, or it can make a reference to um, the opposite, right? It all depends on which feast day is in reference that the actual passage is speaking about in Psalm chapter 83 and verse 1, right? Um, and I'm gonna get, I'll get that in a second. So yeah, I agree with that. In regards to the new moon, now, Historically, the new moon is typically uh, viewed after the equinox, right? So you have the equilux. A week later is the equinox uh, when the sun starts to ascend to its zenith, which it will hit in um, June, 
June 21st, and then it'll continue to rise and hit another zenith. And that is what we get during, you know, the you know, closing down in the summer going into the fall. And then once it hits the fall, quote unquote fall, it hits another equilux. And then it starts to descend until we get to the lowest point of the sun being during December 21st, right? Where we have a lot of, you know, death, burial, and resurrection cults that happen around that time period because it's equating a deity to the sun setting down and being the slowest point for several days before rising back up, right? Um, so how do we know that the equinox is a good marker in regards to the new year, right? Or indicator that the new year is about to begin, or it may begin around the same time a day later, the same day of or whatever the case may be. And that's because you have to look at terrestrial signs as well, right? So when I do this, I try to break it down so that people can remember it. And it's three terrestrial signs and three celestial signs, right? You mentioned Genesis chapter one, verses 14 and 18 that mentioned the sun, moon, and stars. He says he's giving you light for seasons. And that word for seasons is moedim, meaning the annual gathering. So that means when he created them, <coughs> it wasn't for the seasons that we know in temperate zones where we have, you know, uh, summer, uh, fall, winter, and spring but it's for the annual gatherings that were to come in regards to Yisrael. So even his arrangement in regards to the heavenly bodies is in regards to Israel, right? The annual gatherings. And he also makes it for days, he says, and years as well to count time. And when he says this, he's talking about the lights, plural. So lights, plural, that includes the sun, the moon, and the stars. These are three different lights that is utilized to determine and reckon time in the ancient Near East when time was relative. What does we mean by relative? That means typically when there are events in their environment, whether terrestrial, celestial, then different things are counted based on events that happen in the earth with amongst the people or things that happen in the sky, like an eclipse, you know, for one example, right? And things of that nature that is typically used as a pinpoint on a timeline to indicate that, hey, and after the 10th year of the eclipse of so-and-so, this happened. Or they'll do it in regards to kings, an ascension date or descension date in regards to kings. And the fourth year of King Solomon, like it says in 1 Kings chapter 6, he began, he completed the foundation of the temple, right? And then it goes to say in the 11th year of King Solomon, the temple was completed, right? So again, King Solomon's ascension him going to the throne is an event that happens, an event marker that happens in their environment. And then they count days since then. In the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 6, it says 480 years after the Exodus. The Exodus is a pivotal event that happened in the history of the people. So they use that as a time marker, as a pinpoint on a timeline, and they count the years after that, right? That's called relative dating, meaning that they don't really need a calendar. All they got to do is look at the celestial signs. And every time they see certain events happen in patterns across the years, they just use that to count one, two, three, four, right? They didn't have calendars like we do today, and they didn't have absolute timing. Absolute timing came with the Greco-Romans, right? So these three lights in the skies, you have the sun, which is used to count the days, right? You know, every time the sun comes and the sun comes and the sun comes up, that's one day two day, three day, four day. Then you have the moon and the moon goes through phases, right? The moon goes through its dark phase or we say, um, the some say it's the new moon, but we call it the dark moon. And then from there, it starts to go into a gibbous phase, right? Until it hits the full moon. And then and that's, that's within a period of 14 days, it's the full moon. And then 14 days, it goes into a crescent stage until it gets back to the dark moon. So this, that's used to determine the months. How do we know that? Well, let's get into scripture, right? Well, before, before I continue, if you have another question, Tyrone, let me know real quick. I don't want to go too far ahead if you had a question or something like that. No, 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 no. Paul, well, there was a word that you referenced uh, as far as the equinox or a week before equinox. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the equilux. Yeah, E-Q-U-I-L-U-X, equilux. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people don't reckon that, but that's very important because that's when you get uh, the time period in temperate zones when you have 
12 hours a day and 12 hours a night. That's the only time of the year that happens, and it happens twice, in the spring and in the fall. Other than that, you never have equal day and equal night. Only those two days you have equal day and equal night. If you're in a temperate zone, if you're in a tropical zone, that's another you know, thing altogether. However, where the Israelites were at and where Israel's at, it was a temperate zone. <clears throat> so for them, they would have two periods during the year where it's equal day, equal night, and that's called the equilux. The equinox is not equal day, equal night. That comes a week after that, which means that you begin to get more sun or more daylight than you do nighttime, right, over time, okay? All right, so, um, yeah, so jot that down. Take a look at that. I want to show in First Kings chapter 6 where the moon is used to count months, right? And again, if you have a calendrical system that does not include the moon, like those that follow the Anakian calendar, um, it's going to be extremely problematic and it's going to conflict with scripture. OK, so in first Kings, I'm going I'm to do it again. First Kings chapter six that I referenced earlier. And I want to show something. Right. Because how do we know that the calendrical system that's used by Jews today is not the ancient pre-exilic calendar? And it is a byproduct of Babylonian captivity. That's very important, right? What well, we're going to see in 1 Kings chapter 6, the answer is right there. So let me pull that up real quick. 1 Kings chapter 6. Zoom in, right? Okay. And it says, in the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of what? Zeb, which is what? The second month he began to build the house of the Lord. Zeb? I don't, I don't see too many calendars that have Zeb as the second month, but this is what scripture says. I didn't really make this up. So Zeb is the second month. The word there for month is Kodesh. We're going to find something very interesting as I jump down to the bottom of the page. But just keep that in mind. If Zeev is the second month, and this is before captivity, which we call pre-exilic, then how come the second month in the Jewish calendar is not Zeev? That's fascinating. Even before we go there, right, before I, before I move forward, let me jump back a little bit. Right, let's go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13 says, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by strong hand Yah brought you up out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today is the month of Aviv. It doesn't say Nisan there, it says Aviv. So if Aviv or Abib, is the second is the first month and Zeev is the second month, then why do we have calendars that do not reflect this? Where's that influence coming from? Hmm? Fascinating. Okay, let's get back to let's get back to first Kings chapter six and let's jump down, right? Verse 37. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. In the month of what? Zeev. That means four years from the beginning on the in the same month. Remember, the month is Zeev, which is the second month. That means four years after when he started the building the foundation, it was completed, right? And then look at verse 38. And in the 11th year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the month of bull, which is the eighth month. The house was finished in all its parts and according to all the specifications, he was seven years in building it. You're going to say, well, Devon, if it says Kodesh there, that doesn't mean that the month is used to reckon, uh, the moon is used to reckon the month. Well, let's see what it says in the text, right? Let's use that until the near. And uh, as you saw in the beginning of this live, make sure you're signing up for these classes, okay? We did an introductory class. And now we're on class one. Next Tuesday is class two. We're having a great time. And there's a lot of information being shared in this class. And this class that we just did, we're going through the language. Okay. And again, this is not a language course that I'm teaching. 
This is just using various elements in a holistic paradigm in order to properly approach Bible study, which means language is one of many elements that we use in regards to our research methodology. OK, and I'm showing everybody the language, the rules of the language, how to use an interlinear to help them until they get to recognize patterns and understand grammar rules, using what grammar tools to use, etc. So if you're not signed up for the classes, go to www.patreon.com backslash divine prospect. OK, we're going heavy into that. Make sure you sign up for the $50 here because that's where we give you the classes. OK, now watch this, right? We have here in the year, Uba, Uba, Shana. We know this word Shana meaning year, right? So we have here, this is the conjunctive wav meaning and. We have the prepositional bait, right? Which means what? In, it can mean in, at, but in this case, and in year, that's literally what it says. There's no definite article. Well, I, I can't say that. it is a definite article, right? The batak underneath the bait can indicate the definite article. So it can say, and in the year, shana, right? We have the chametz underneath the shin and the nun, and we have a he here. We have our bait, and we have our wav, with the, which is a shurik, which we say is u, u, ba, shana. If you want the rest of this, you know, we go into that in the classes, but I'm going to hold it from there. So we have here, it says, and in the, because the pakak can function as what we call defective writing. So instead of having the hay here, you can remove it and just put the pakak underneath the bait. Okay. So in, and in the year one and 10, look at this right here. Be yerach. Be yerach. This right here, be means what? In prepositional, inseparable preposition, prepositional bait. And then we have a yod, we have a zegol, we have a resh, we have a patach, and we have a chet. Right? This right here, this yod, resh, chet, this means moon. They translate it as month. That's bad. This means moon. The moon of what? Bull. Bull, that means the moon is the indicator to know what month it is. And then it goes on to say, Hu, Ha Chodesh, right? Hu, which means that, this is a, a, a pronoun, that, and they have is in brackets, but that or which, and we have which is Ha, which we have the definite article here, Ho, Chet, Cholam, Dalet, Segol and Shin, Chodesh, Chodesh. That is the month. What month? Hash, She, Mini. Whenever you see this little uh, triangle without the um, bottom part, that is the E sound. And that's made with the Hirik and Yod. E. That's the eighth month. The moon of bull is the eighth month. So you have Zeev, which is the second month, and Zeev is indicated by the moon. You have bull, which is the eighth month, and we know those months are reckoned by the moon. You can't get around that. That's what text says. And then we have Abib, which is the first month that we see in Exodus chapter 13. Now, what about Another name for another month. Well, let's go to First Kings chapter 8. And it says here, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's houses of the people of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Watch verse 2. All, and all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, what is that? Which is the seventh month. Abib was the first month. Zeev is the second month. Ethanim is the seventh month. And Bull is the eighth month. Now, why are only these four months mentioned? Abib means green in the air, which means it's talking about when the barley and flax is ripe 
as these cereal stalks ripen over time, they get more brittle and they change color from green to brown. Okay. Now we see that when we go to Exodus chapter nine and we jump here to verse 30. Now the hail is coming down. Watch verse 31. It says the flax and the barley were struck down for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. That means they were ripe or ripening past their peak point of harvest. But the wheat in emmer, which is a slightly later harvest, were not struck down for they are late coming up. So when you're, again, first month begins, the barley and the flax must be in the ear and in the bud, ready to be harvested. That's why the first month is called Aviv. And this is chapter 9. This is during the plague of the hail. And then when we get to Exodus 12, after the last plague and the death of the firstborn, they have their feast day, right? Or the instructions for the feast day. When we get to Exodus chapter 13, it says this is Abib, which is the first Is it just me or it? I can't really hear you that well. I don't. I hope it's not me though. I, I can't really hear you too well, brother. Can you hear me now? Was I muted that whole time? It's. I could actually hear you a little. Like it was very little though. I could hear you a little bit, but you. All right. So let me see. What? What? Uh, at what point did y'all not hear no more? What was the last thing you heard? You were talking about the... the like it was two minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were talking about the seventh month. and they the, moved this further away from bar, me. Okay. Yeah, you were talking gotcha. about the barley comes up in the first Yeah, month, so, so that's know. what I was saying. So the barley is the indicator to know when it's Aviv, and Aviv literally means green in the air, and you cannot have a reckoning of time without the barley harvest being ripe. When the barley is ripe, then you can pluck it, then you know, okay, this is one of the terrestrial signs that we are in the new year because we see in exodus 9 this was the plague of the hills and then uh four chapters later he says this is the first month when they've when in, in regards to the, the everything that happened in the land after they left out he says this is the first month right indicating that that month that they left out was the month of aviv so he gave them the instructions for passover they kept passover they didn't know, like the count at that point. He just told them, this is the last plague. This is Passover. And this is 11 bread. Now, once they had that meal and they left out, then he says, just to let you know that this month that this happened in is the month of Aviv. But Jews are following Nisan. So therefore, it is not in sync with the pre-exilic Israelite calendar. That is what we teach here, right? So... Knowing that, first terrestrial sign, which is the barley and the flax. Now, there are additional terrestrial signs to know what time it is, okay? Now, we're going to get those from Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And when we jump all the way down to verse... 10, it says, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, what? The winter is past. The rain is over and gone. In Israel, there is a wintry rain season from November, or let's say extremely late October, early November, until March. 
That's important. When that happens, when it's, when it's the wintry rain, that is considered the winter. Obviously, it's called the wintry rain, right? When that's gone, then the flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. Turtle doves leave out of the land before the wintry rains, and they return after the wintry rains. So there's a wintry rain season from November to March. That means you cannot have your springtime during that period of time when those wintry rains are coming down. And then that's 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 the weather. Second terrestrial sign. First is the crops. Second is the weather. Third is the migration of the turtle doves. So if you're going to say this is the first of the month or the new year, but your barley's not right for plucking, you got problem. The wintry rains are still there. You have a problem. And the turtle doves that have not migrated to the land, you have a problem. You need those three terrestrial signs to pinpoint when it's the beginning of the year. That's important. And that's from scripture. I didn't make this up. Now, you also have other things like in the book of Jeremiah where it talks about the Jenny and the Jenny being in heat in its season. Well, typically the Jenny is in heat from the time period of late March, early April for three months, the Jenny is in heat. If you don't see no Jennies, which are female donkeys, that's in heat in the land of Israel during that time period after the winter rains are gone, the turtle doves has migrated, right? And the crops are coming up. Then you're, you're definitely not in springtime. Animals and earth don't need a calendar to know what time it is. When they're ready, they are ready to let you know it is time. They are the indicators for us who have lost our ways because we're out of sync with nature and it's designed to reorient us back to Yah's calendar, to his reckoning of time, the ancient way, right? The indigenous way, the cultural way, right? We don't have that today. So first we have an issue where we have months that are different than the calendar Jews do today, like Tishrei and Nisan and Adar, etc. Though There's no such thing as that in regards to this. We only have Aviv, Ziv, month three, four, five, six, Ethanim and Bull, and that's it. The priests were only responsible for calling out the months of Aviv and Bull. By the time you get to Bull, all the feast days should be done. When Aviv, when Aviv starts, you have Passover and you have 11 bread. But if you're unclean, you have a second month called Ziv where you can keep Passover and where you can keep 11 bread. It can be done in the second month, which means the reckoning for the first month Still is there, but if you're not clean by the time the 14th and 15th day come, then you can put off Passover until the second month, which is Zeev. That's why Zeev has a name. Now, when it comes to uh, Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, now that is the indicator that we are midway through the year. Midway through the year, approaching what we call the fall, which is indicated by Ethanim, the seventh month, as we've seen in 1 Kings chapter 8. And that month is reckoned by a moon, which we see in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38. These pre-exilic months are reckoned by moons, okay? And then we know there's the count. So when we get to Shavuot, that's the indicator that we are halfway through the year, the Sashadado, which means priestly, priestly reckoning of time and then when we get to the seventh month at the name the final feasts are there which is trumpets the first day of the seventh month and on the 15th day you have tabernacles or sukkot once sukkot is completed the last day the eighth day is feast of ingathering you have to you're going to have a feast means you're going to be outside and the purpose of this feast and being outside is to bring everything in from the wine press everything in from the threshing floor because the wintry rains are about to hit and by the time bull comes, the eighth month, all the feast days should be completed. That's all the priests had to deal with. Now, in Israel, there is a 12-month calendar. The Gezer calendar is indicative of a 12-month calendar, but it is a farmer's almanac, which means it's utilized by those who are commencing agriculture. They're not responsible of saying, okay, we're going to do the feast days. No, no, no. That calendar... The 12-month calendar should align with the priestly calendar because the agriculturalists, you know, the ones who are doing 
you know, agriculture and the land, they have to be able to reap the barley and the flax from the land so that it can be given during feasts of first fruits after unleavened bread. But the unleavened bread that they make is typically made out of barley cakes. Not really wheat. Wheat doesn't come to a little later after that. But sometimes you may have an early wheat harvest, but the wheat harvest is never going to precede the barley harvest. The barley harvest is always going to precede the wheat harvest. Okay? Now, when it was first in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, when this happened, it is reckoned based on the barley harvest and the flax harvest in Egypt. And then later on, when it was when they got into the land, then it was modeled in the land after and wreck and in sync with the harvest of the flax and barley in Egypt. That's important. So you have the crops, you have the weather, and then you have the animals, terrestrial signs. Then you have the sun, which is the indicator for days. You have the moon, which is indicated for months. Also, the moon is used to count the feasts. If you don't have the moon. You cannot have a feast day. Let's go to Psalms 104 and 19. Psalms 104 and 19 says, He made the moon to mark the moedim. Seasons. The moon is there to mark the annual gatherings. You cannot have a feast day without the moon. You cannot have a month without the moon. That's very important. So with those eight months that the priests are responsible for counting the days from Aviv first to the end of Bull, during that period of time, that's all the priests were responsible for. That's it. There's no 12 months for the sacerdotal calendar or what we call the menological model. Menological, a menology means the counting or study of months. Because that's all they were dealing with, eight months. That's why there's no intercalation there in Torah. What does intercalation mean? Intercalation is a dartu. When you're following a, only following, listen, a moon or synodic month or lunar year, you have 354 days. Which means you're 11 and a quarter days off in regards to the tropical year or what we call the year that deals with 365 and a quarter, which is the full revolution in regards to the heavenly bodies, whether you believe in flat earth or whatever. You could just observe that and you can tell. What happens is after every three years, if you're following a lunar calendar, you will be off three months. Three months. If you're off three months, you're back a whole season. That means you'll be having Passover in the winter time. So a 13th month has to be added. This came from Babylonian culture where the Chaldean priests tell the Babylonian king, hey, this is the year to add a 13th month. And then the king goes and he decrees it. So he gets his advice from the priests and then the priests give it to him and then he decrees it. This is where the custom of adding a 13th month comes from. That's not in Torah. Torah does not prescribe inter calorie days or intercalation is not mentioned in Torah. If you have to add days to your calendar, like the Enochian calendar, you have to add a whole week after seven years. And like the um, those who follow the dark moon or the first visible crescent and follow a completely lunar calendar, they have to add a 13th month. There's nothing prescribed for that in scripture. So if scripture doesn't prescribe that, then why are we doing that? Where does that custom come from? You got to question that. If the first of the month is called Aviv, and then we get later on in the exilic state, and they're calling it Nisan, where did that come from? And why are we still using that today? How come we're not using Ziv, Ethanim, and Bull? How come those month names are not being used today? All of this is responsible for letting us know that something went awry, and we need to address and question and criticize what has been handed down to us today. So the moon marks the seasons. The moon is also, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, 14 and 18, are used for the seasons, for signs like the eclipse. Those are omens. The signs, the seasons are annual gatherings, the days and the years. You need the sun and you need the moon to reckon that 
and you also need the stars. Side real year is when you're able to determine what day and time and season of year it is by looking at the constellations. So let's go ahead and look at the constellations, right? We're going to get Job chapter 38 and verse 32. This is why we need to observe nature. This is all important, okay? Let's go back. Job chapter 38 and verse 32. And it says this. It says, can you bind the chains of the pleads or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? This word Maseroth there is typically used as uh, for the word that we use for crowns. And crowns glitter because a lot of them are made of lapis, luzili, excuse me, um, and or other uh, elements, earthly elements that have a reflective shine to them. So that crown is representative or used figuratively to talk about the constellations and they have a season. And in that season, according to what's being referenced here, you have the bear with his children, which is Ursa Major and it's constellation stars. Ursa Major can be seen from Israel and it indicates springtime. This is a reference from scripture letting you know that the constellations can be used to determine a season. And one of those constellations is Ursa Major with this constellation stars. Those are the three heavenly signs we use, three earthly signs we use. And when you use all six of them in sync, you can have a precise reckoning of time. And the priest will know when to say it is the new year in ancient times. Now, if you all want sources on that, I'm more than happy to provide that. I'll drop them there in the chat. But just sign up for the Patreon and get access to all of this knowledge. I have tons of material, information, videos, all types of stuff in there, books, articles to give you this information. Right. So that is how we reckon time here. Now, lastly, how do we know that the new moon is a full moon? And after I say this, then I'm going to let the, um, the other guests on stage come on in. And then I'm going to share a whole bunch of references with you. OK, in the chat. All right. All right. So how do we know that the full moon is the new moon? Well, the brother mentioned the scripture in Ecclesiasticus. Right. That's one reference. Another reference we have from scripture itself, because anytime you see the term Chodesh, that means month. We don't have any indicator of what type of moon phase we're dealing with. How do we know that? Because there is a word in Hebrew for crescent. And it's never used in regards to the phase of the moon for the reckoning of time. How fascinating is that? That the text actually has a word for crescent, but it never uses it for the moon. And when he made the sun, moon, and stars, the moon was full because it was considered a great light. The only time that the moon is considered a great light is when it's full. If it's not full, it's not the great light, the greatest that it can be. So as a great light, if that's used, to determine the signs, the seasons, the days and the years, and the seasons being the annual gatherings, then we have to ask the question, is that full moon indicative of when the month starts, or is that full moon indicative of when the feast begins? Which is very interesting, right? We got to ask that question as well, okay? So the full moon being responsible as the new moon, we have a hint of that. Because they are ambiguous texts. For example, when we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 to 18, I'm going to say that's an ambiguous text because that can be a reckoning for when the new months appear. Because there's annual gatherings on the first of every month in ancient Israel. That's called the new moon feast and festival. New moon feast and festival. Let me get that for you. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10 and verse 10. All right. Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. It says, 
on the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feast, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of you before your power, or Elohecha. I am Yah Elohecha, your power, right? That's very important because in the beginning of every month, there is a feast, just like the appointed feast days within certain months. So in regards to this, there are various things we're going to deal with because I mentioned that. We also have here in Exodus chapter 9. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 8. Excuse me. Exodus chapter, what am I doing? Exodus chapter 10. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yes. Exodus chapter 10, talking about the ninth plague of darkness. Okay. This is important. Then Yah said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Mitraim, a darkness to be felt. So Moshe stretched out his hand towards Shemaim, and there was pitch darkness over all the land of Egypt three days. What's very interesting is if you observe the full moon, it's actually full for three days. Very fascinating why there will be darkness over the moon for three days and the sun and the stars. Now, during the day, if there's darkness, obviously you can't see nothing at night. You definitely can't see nothing. And the stars, you can't see nothing. So all of these elements have to be lit in order for this plague to have significance to the Egyptians because there's a God over the moon itself. And when it's the full moon, it typically is when they do their feast, right? Because that's, they, they're worshiping their moon god, right? Toth and, or Jehuti is their moon god. He was the god over the moon. And there was other gods over time and different gnomes with different um, Nesut BT's rules. But that was significant. If you cast darkness for three days, the three days covers the moon cycle, which is full for three days that can be seen over Egypt and in the land of Israel. So the significance of having it dark for three days is that you don't see that moon becoming full. That light is blocked out, the sun is blocked out, and the stars is blocked out. Why is that significant? Because we saw that a moon indicates when a month begins. So now if we're in Exodus chapter 10 and we're approaching Exodus 13 where the High says this is the first of the month for you, right? This month is the first of the month, but we know on the 14th and 15th day of that same month is when they had their feast days. Well, it either could be one of two things. Either one, this happened... These events happen prior or during a period of time, or it, that's why I say it's ambiguous, or it happened where the full moon became the moon that they used for the feast, or it was approaching the first of the month when this plague happened, and then more time spread out for the remaining plagues, three more plagues to occur, and then you had your full moon, which was then blacked out during this time period. The full moon was blacked out. If that's the case, I'm just saying, I'm just pitching this out there for three days. And then that indicated that their month, which began, is blocked out for three days. And then over time, which would be your two weeks, while they're still in captivity and these plagues are happening, because we don't have a time period in when these plagues are occurring. We don't know if it's five days, if it's one week, if it's one day. The text doesn't give us any explicit information. What I'm saying is, when you look at this, in order for this plague to be felt, this darkness to be felt at night, because it's already dark at night. But if you block out the moon being full during those three days, and then time passes where now it's the dark moon in which they have their feast period. And so oh, how did that moon indicate the feast? I'm going to get into that in one second, right? Now that would be an indicator that one of the moon phases are being reckoned here. That's why I say it's ambiguous because some argue it either way. Scholars argue it either way. And I'm using this to say this can refer to the fact that those three days is representative of when the moon is full for three days and the moon's full light is blacked out. And therefore, this is a sign against Pharaoh that your God is not God because he was supposed to be responsible for keeping the moon and the sky where there's a feast to their God. But guess what? It's dark now. But the Israelites were not affected. 
When you go on to say, when you go on to read this, it says, um, they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But watch this. But all the people of Israel had lights where they lived. Sun, stars, and moon, wherever they were at in Goshen, which is the distance from where Pharaoh was at, they had light. It doesn't specify they only had light during the day. It just says that they had light. And obviously, if it's pitch black for three days, you're blocking the lights at night, which is the stars and the moon, because these are there to rule the night. This is important. So they had light when the Egyptians didn't. So that's another indicator that there was a full moon or maybe a late gibbous transitioning into a full moon. Now, these are little nuances that most people that teach the calendar do not address, right? So, again, we have this reference here. Now, let's go to Psalms. Let me get Psalms 83. Oh, 83, 82. Wow, 81. I'm off today. What is going on? It must be tired. All right, here we go. Psalms 81 and 3 says, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. So this can be read straightforward without these commas that is indicated here in English. Or it can mean blow the trumpet at the new moon, which we read in um, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. And it could be referring to at the full moon as a second time when this is done and on our feast day a third time. Or it could be referenced to blow trumpet at the new moon and then reckon at the full moon happens on the feast day. There's three different ways that you can interpret this. So, see, when I teach, I don't teach just my perspective. I teach the multitude or multiplicity or plethora of different positions that exist out there. Right. So what I say is that this should be read straight through. Because if you look here, right here, this is the BSB, right? It says, sound the ram's horn at the moon moon and at the full moon on the feast day. So this right here is breaking it up where you don't have the second, uh, second comma, but it's rendering here together with this. Which means if there is a full moon on the day of the feast, what feast is it referring to? And is this plural? Because if it was, if it meant to refer to, let's say, um, unleavened bread, Passover, and let's say meant to men mention Sukkot or tabernacles, it would be plural, right? Or if it's referencing just one feast singular, what one feast would it be referencing where the moon is full if it's singular? Well, let's get into that real quick. Right, so when we when we read the word here, Chag Genu, Chag Chet Patach, then we have a um a Gimel that has a Dagesh in the middle, a Noon and a Shurk, right, which is a Wav with the Dagesh, Chag Genu. Is this plural or singular? Well, when we have the reckoning here, it should be. This right here, Chag, this right here is singular on our feast. Leom, Leom. This is to the day, and someone put of our feast, but to the day of the feast. This word Chag right here, this right here means feast. And this new is a suffix that means our feast. This word feast is not in the plural here, singular. So what full moon can occur on a singular feast day? What particular feast day happens when you have a full moon where the trumpet is blown on a particular feast day? It can't be the new moons because those will be plural. It can't be uh, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Sukkot because that would be plural. If it's singular, the only feast day singular that you can blow that you're supposed to blow the trumpet at the full moon 
is the first day of Ethanim or the Feast of Trumpets. So if the full moon is used to reckon a particular feast day singular, then we're dealing with trumpets. This word here, kise, right here, we're going to look into this word kise. This is a long word, long word from Assyria. The Syrian language is the donor language. Hebrew is the recipient language. Kise, kise. And we go to kise. We see it says here, they call it what? The full moon. Its origin is dubious. And it says perhaps it's a Syrian loan word because we see a cognate in a Syrian, kuseu. A headdress or a cat, which is agu. It's very interesting. And also the full moon as what? The tiara of the moon god. Now, in my lecture, my full-on lecture, I go into extreme detail about this. But it comes from another culture. It's not even Israelite culture. That means when this was written, they were in Assyrian captivity when the psalm was added to the book of Tehillim. Okay? Because it's the only way you can get that loan word. Because prior to that, if, if David was in the 10th century uh, BCE, you didn't have the Assyrians on the scene at that time. There's no way they could borrow something from an entity that did not exist at that time. What happened was the Assyrian king... Once a year during the Agu festival, would get a kuseu or a headdress or a tiara that would be uh, bestowed upon him to showcase that the moon god Sin was approving of the king's reign. It's a procession that would occur and where he would wear that. So lapis lazuli was the royal blue rich royal blue reflective material that the crown was made so that way during the day or during the night specifically during the night the light would hit it and it will reflect off the crown and the king will be hoisted up and all will see it who come together okay now that's important all right so the reason why i say this is because this is why they said that that should be rendered as full moon because of its cognate origin. So we have something that's very interesting here, right? In regards to using scriptural detectual data, primary source data, to make a case for the full moon, okay? Now, there's others, but I'm going to pause right here because I know we have other people still on the panel. I'm going to give them an opportunity to speak, and I do want to share all of these sources. OK. All right. So, um, Tyrone, if you have any additional input, I'm going to give you a few minutes and then I'm going to move on to the next person on the panel. Okay, my brother. OK, just to make sure I'm understanding that correctly is um, in Psalm 81. As it reads in Hebrew, because I saw the different translations and whatnot, the full moon there is only indicating the Feast of Trumpets. It's not to reflect how any other, I guess, new moon or the beginnings of the months could be reflected by a full moon as well. It's only talking about solely the Feast of Trumpets. Well, what I'm saying is if they meant it to be a regular occurrence that happened with multiple feast days, number one, or new moons, number two, then your word for feast there would be in the plural, right? Yeah. So it wouldn't be uh, a, a masculine singular uh, construct, right? It would be in the plural, but because the plural is not represented here and it's referring to one feast day, then when do you blow the trumpet at the new moon when it's full on a feast day? The only time that that's done is at the name one, which is the feast of trumpets. Gotcha. And um, could you, before you open up the panel, could you show that word? Because I know you're Ray. Um, is usually referring to a month, but it's in some cases it refers to a moon too. But could you show that crescent moon word? Yeah, uh, Saharon. So Saharon is the one for crescent moon. That's in the book of uh, Isaiah. So let me pull it up for you real quick. All right, so that's, um, let me pull it up for you. So Saharon is in Isaiah 3.18. So let me pull that up real quick. And that is your word for moon. So crescent moon. 
All right, so Isaiah 3, 18. Okay. So here it says, Yah said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, menacing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore, Adonai will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and Yah will lay bare their secret parts. Verse 18. In that day, Adonai will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, and the crescents. The pendants, the bracelets, and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, and the amulets, the signet rings and nose rings, the festal robes, the mantle, the cloaks, and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans, and the veils. The word crescents in verse 18. And crescent is going to give you your indicator for the word saharon. So you have right here the shin, the he, and the resh, right? However, there's a holam nun. Whenever you have a holam nun at the end of a word, that is a diminutive in the Hebrew, meaning that you are reducing something to a smaller, more endearing form of what the root word is, sahar. So when you look up sahar, right, not with the own, but with just word sahar, that is your root word, which reference the moon. However, when you put the own holam noon at the end of it, there's a suffix, you put it in its diminutive form, and that would be the case because a crescent is a smaller version of the full moon. You'll see the same thing in Judges chapter 8, verse 21, where it's reckoned as ornaments, and we know that's an ornament there because we see within the context is referencing other forms that are ornaments, headbands, finery of the anklet, anklet braces, pendants, bracelets, armlets, all of these things, amulets, signet rings, all of these things are indicative of ornaments, something that is used to decorate the body with. This has nothing to do, it's not making no reference or connection to the actual moon phase that's there to reckon time. But the word is here. If any of the authors wanted to use it in connection with reckoning of time for the month, and they never use it. And when we see it also in Judges, it's referencing, again, ornaments that's being used, right? It's not referencing anything in regards to, um, hold on, let me click it again. Anything in regards to the moon phase. Let me click it right bring it down all right right here so judges 8 21 it says then zeva and zal muna said get up and kill us yourself for as the man is so is his strength so gideon got up and killed zeva and zal muna and he took the crescent ornaments from the necks of their camels obviously the moon phase can't be on the neck of a camel this is translated as an ornament when you see it. The weight of the gold earrings he had requested was 1,700 shekels. In addition to the crescent ornaments, the pendants, you see that? So now in the same sentence, you have another ornament called the pendants, and that is connected to whatever Saharon is, which has to be an ornament that resembles the crescent moon. Because Sahar, as a reference, goes back to a moon, something in reference to a moon. The purple garments of the kings of Midian and the chains from the necks of their camels, which is what? A crescent ornament. Again, the word is there if they wanted to use crescent in connection with the moon phase, but the text never uses it that way. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's um, that's good because that was something that um, I was struggling with in the beginning, but yeah, I, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, in in my Bible, it says a little different, but it doesn't matter because when you look back into the word, it correct the same thing. And then, um, so there was a an ancient group called the Magarians, right? Have you ever heard of them? I have not. Okay, so let me pull something up real quick. Let me pull up a quick reference to them.
the Megarians. Oops, 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 oops. All right. So here, and this is from a book that I'm gonna share with y'all called Calendar and Community. Matter of fact, let me just bring up, let me just pull up the book so I can give you the direct reference. I was gonna wait until the guest spoke before pulling it up, but I might as well just pull it up. So calendar and community. I'm gonna pull it up right now. And then I'm going to go to the reference for the Megarians in the full moon. Okay, let's go here. Okay. Page. Okay, this is page 102. So let me go to page 102. And then we're going to read about the 104. I'm going to read about the Megarians. Okay, let me zoom in. And this should be, let's go here. All right, let me go ahead and share it. All right. There you go. Let me know when y'all can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, 3.1.4, Megarians. Yeah, yep. Page 104, right? It says here, but the sighting of the new moon was not necessarily the basis of all what? Early Jewish calendars. The lunar months of Qumran calendars may have begun at other times, e.g. at the conjunction or invisibility of the old moon. In the later Roman period, a number of sources suggest that the conjunction was increasingly preferred. In later sources, we will have to consider whether this represents a general trend in Jewish lunar calendars and whether this trend reflects a similar development in the rabbinic calendar, which is known to have what? Shifted from empirical observations to a fixed calendrical calculation. All of this is shown when you read this book. It's letting you know that this reckoning of time where we have this conjunction or FVC reckoning the beginning of a month is a later invention amongst the Jews. When we say late, we mean post-exilic. Here, when we go to the Megarians, it says, as stated at the beginning of this chapter, in almost all ancient lunar calendars, the month began around the time of the new moon. The only Jewish calendar known to have begun uh, the month at the time of the full moon, this is what they're saying, and they're trying to figure out why it's the case, is that of the Megarians. The Megarians are a little-known sect, first mentioned in Karait al-Kirkisani, which is in 930 CE, and then al-Biruni in 1000 CE. Al-Kirkisani places this sect chronologically between the Sadducees and Jesus, and this apparently corroborates a statement by Shah Rastani, early 12th century, who dates, and these are all Arabic scholars, right? Who dates them 400 years before Arios, thus also about the 1st century BCE. In view of this corroboration, Harkavi treats this dating as reliable, but this is to ignore that both authors are drawing on the same source, naming the work non extent of Duad B. Maran al Mukamis which is the late 9th to early 10th century. They, let's go down, cannot be treated, therefore, as corroborating each other. Poznanski, 1905, sees no reason why the Megarians could not have been a later sect, for instance, of the 7th or 8th century. It should be noted, however, that al Kirkinsini reports that in his day, the Megarian sect was already extinct. So, therefore, it cannot be during the 7th century in which they're being referenced. They have to be earlier because the author, the, the Arabic author during the 7th century said they were extinct during his time. So Ponsansky, excuse me, Poznansky is wrong in his assertion of saying they are 7th to 8th century because by the 7th century, when al kir Kinsani is reporting about this, the sect wasn't even there anymore. So they couldn't have existed at the time. Both al kir Kinsani and al Biruni mentioned that the Megarians began their month at the full moon. According to al kir Kinsani, this is because the Megarians believed that when it was created, the moon was what? Perfect and full. 
Now, what's interesting is you have another reference in the book of Enoch about the full moon beginning the month. I'm going to wait and pull that up in a second. But this is a sect that was known historically to actually have used the full moon to indicate the beginning of the month. A lot of the references that we have in regards to the indication of the moon in regards to time being used is from Babylonian counts or late Mesopotamian sources either Neo-Assyrian or Babylonian sources. When we go back prior to that, like when we get to the late Bronze Age, you know, the time period in which Moses should have existed, and when he was told this is the beginning of months and so forth, that was before we get any of the uh, moon phase of the crescent being reckoned by Mesopotamian kings. You'd have to go far back as the Akkadian rulers or the Sumerian rulers to see if they reckoned the time or the months via the crescent moon. And when you do that research, I'm going to say it's very interesting. Right? So this is an actual sect that we can reference to historically that actually did keep the full moon. Now, what's interesting is this sect was found around the Qumran caves. Very interestingly, they wind up disappearing off and becoming extinct. Right? However, amongst the Book of Enoch, and another source I'm going to bring up later on, you'll see that Enoch has a reckoning of the full moon for the new moon, which is very uh, alarming because there's also a reference to the dark moon being the new moon as well. So scholars are looking at this from three different manuscripts and saying, well, how is this the case? How can it be the case that they have a new moon being the dark moon and a new moon being a full moon? Well, in regards to what was going on at that time period, right, the uh, the crescent moon or the dark moon pretty much won the consensus of what should be used to account for the beginning of months. However, this is what the scholars say in this in this uh, resource I'm about to bring out. They say that the reference to the full moon reckoning is a more older or ancient tradition that they did not remove from the book of Enoch for fear of creating sacrilege against the text. They didn't want to remove it, so they left it there, which is fascinating because those will be elements from an oral tradition. But the new moon will be elephant elements of things that have happened during their time period, during their day. Because when the Greeks came on the scene, the Greeks were using the moon to reckon times. And because the Jews hated the Greeks for what they did. And, and, you know, and sacrificing the pig, Antiochus sacrificing the pig on the altar and then them persecuting the Jews and telling them to forsake the law and trying to change times. Now, when they get out of the rule from underneath the Greeks, when they fight back during the Maccabean period and establish the Hasmonean dynasty, now they are writing about the emphasis on the moon not being used to reckon time and to put the sun back in place to reckon time because the moon was associated with the Greeks and the Babylonians. So therefore, to get up under that, they said, no, we must restore the calendar back to where it was, where the sun was the main reference for counting time for the feast days, etc. And that was only because of the issue with the Greeks using the moon cycle. The Greeks got that when Alexander the Great went into Babylon Right, excuse me, not Babylon. He went into yes, Babylon after he defeated the Persians and encountered the Chaldean priests and how they had a formal structured system of reckoning time, which the Greek peoples in Greece and the Aegean Sea did not have. They had various calendars, Athenian calendar, Macedonian, they had various calendars. But when he saw their calendar, he adopted it as the official calendar for his empire. So this is very important. Now, when we continue to read. This is very similar to what you get in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is why they said that there's a very interesting connection between that old reckoning of time and this sect called the Megarians that are carry on this older tradition. It's very similar to what we see in the Enochian tradition because it says here, al -Birini, Biruni, excuse me, may mean that the original full moon of the fourth day of creation, i.e. Wednesday, and perhaps all subsequent New Year full moons that happen to occur on Wednesdays which would occur on average every seven years, served to Megarians as epochs for the calculation of subsequent days, full moons, and festivals within cycles on average of seven years. Anytime you see this reference of seven years, this is referencing a jubilee, 
And all of this connects back to the Qumran community, the Yahad community that was led by the teacher of righteousness. And there was various sects there, not just one monolithic sect. And you'll see these doctrines start to come from that region because they've isolated themselves from the sects that were in Jerusalem because they said that they were all tainted by idolatry and nothing is clean in the land. So to avoid themselves from being unclean, a lot of them adopted vegetarianism, right? However, when you go into detail, you'll find out that, again, on the fourth day is what's believed in the Enochian calendar is when you had the sun, moon, and stars. Well, the text never uses the word bara when it talks about the sun, moon, and stars. Bara is what's used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which is believed to follow the doctrine of ex nihilio. That means something out of nothing. That means it came out of nowhere, and the Most High just created these lights on the fourth day. The word asath is used, and asath literally means to decrease something, to structure something to happen at a particular time, period. It does not mean to create something from scratch. We have no usage of that anywhere in the text for the word asath. None. But whenever we see bara, it is only reference to a divine thing that he can bring about that's new. We don't have that for the usage of the same of a similar word, which is Asa. So that means he did not make the sun, moon and stars on the fourth day. He gave them their decree. These lights were already there in what we call the primordial waters or the chaotic waters of Yam. It was already there. But when he did the separation and the pulling apart and created the vault to hold back the waters from above, that is where he placed or filled the constellations at, according to the ancient reckoning of time and cosmogony. That's that what was established. So I have another source, not this one, from the other book I'm going to pull and show you from that goes deeper into the Megarians and says that this sect is connected to the sect that lost. And the consensus of how moon cycles should be reckoned, you know, using the dark moon or the FBC to indicate a new moon. And that older sect phased out. The one that said that the full moon brings in the month, they phased out. And then you had this rise of a new sect that started to say, OK, let's go and use the crescent moon to continue to indicate our full moons. Right. Excuse me, our new moons, not full moons. Excuse me. Right. So it's very fascinating research when you research it, look at it historically. That this new this new moon as the full moon is a more ancient reckoning, and using the crescent or the dark moon to indicate the beginning of a month is something that is a later invention and or a result of the exile. It's very fascinating, right? So I'm gonna share this source again. I've shared this millions of times in the past. Every time I talk about the subject matter, but I'm gonna throw it in the chat and again. Sign up for the Patreon and you get access to over 500 books that I have on a Patreon. And there's at least 20 of them on the calendars, right? The other calendar uh, book that I want to share is something that is very important that talks about Enoch. And I'm going to share this last one. And then if you have anything final you want to say, Tyron, I'm going to give you a few minutes to close out. Um, unless you want to say something now, I'm going to pull up the second source. And um, yes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I don't I don't know. Uh... I don't need to close. I think that was real good. I actually um, had someone bring up a Talmudic reference to me. I don't know. What is what, it? I don't remember what it was, but I know he was using it to state that the the new moon was a was a dark moon or a crescent. Right. It says that in the Talmud. Yeah, the conjunction moon. It says that in the Talmud. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I don't remember. But that, that explains why that happens because I see that the way you, the way you like kind of structure your research is whenever you see a variant, you try to figure out why what's the cause of the variant that gives facts. It. Facts. So, so I consider the midrashim, right, which is important, right, uh, which is commentary, right. If we're doing midrashim in regards to agada, then we're dealing with the narrative, and we're doing with um, midrashim in regards to the law. That's halakha or halakha, right. And Midrashim is something that's done, was done by the Jews that we have a lot of writings of at the turn of the first century CE, right? And then we have the Mishnah in the Talmud and the Gemara where conversations arise around the moon phase being the conjunction moon. But then in the fourth century, Helil II presided over the final Sahedrin council and he created a method 
for them to remember how to reckon time according to the calendrical system they had at that time because he knew they would be dispersed in a diaspora, right? They knew it was coming. So at their final council, they reckoned a format to determine how to reckon time to keep the feast days. That's the Halil II calendrical model. Now, that's an invention that occurred in the 4th century CE, right? So knowing history about all these things are very, very important. Just like I, I mentioned to you, you had four months that was known in the pre-exilic period. Abib, Ziv, Ethanim, and Bull. But by the time we get to the Persian captivity with Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, all of a sudden the names of the months change. Obviously, at that time period, they were in exile. They were not in the land. When they was in the land, they had those names for the months. When they got into exile, everything changed. So now you got to question stuff. Well, if that changed, what else changed? Apparently, they got an Adar 2. Well, we don't see nothing like Adar 2 anywhere in the scriptures prior to exile. Where's that at? Where's Adar at? Or Adar 2, which means you're adding a 13th month. Where's that at? I don't see that. Matter of fact, in the land, the Gezir calendar, that's about 9th century BCE, has 12 months, not nothing that says a 13th month. So even the farmer's almanac or the almanac or calendrical model used to reckon time in relation to agriculture doesn't even mention a 13th month in the land. So where the heck did that come from? Not where the Israelites were at, not where the Canaanites were at. That's a Mesopotamian invention. That's where that comes from. We have no evidence of that being land representing a 13th month. So why are Jews using a 13th month or reckoning a 13th month? Why? That's not Torah. Torah doesn't prescribe that. So I look at stuff like that and I say, wow, you know what? This is very fascinating. So I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this next reference real quick. Right. This is. Um, let me see if I could pull it up like this. Let's see if I can find it. And this is going to be regards to, let me look it up. It's going to be regards to Enoch. It's the book of Enoch, right? Let me pull it out on a quick pause. Let's see. All right. So uh, the cycle of festivals in regards to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, festivals of Passover on the bread, raising the sheath. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gezir calendar. This is what I mentioned. This is, oh, let me share the book with y'all real quick. Hold on. So you can see what I'm looking at. Let's share it real quick. All right, here we go. All right. Now this is in reference to the Gezir calendar that I referenced to you, right? Now you also have other sources, right? This present chapter focuses on some of the, the those sources and consider. And these are additional sources outside the mainstream sources, like the Gezer calendar, first temple, first temple, and the word that they use for month in a Gezer a Gezer calendar is Yeriach. It's not Chodesh. The Elephantine papyri, which occurs during Persian captivity, the writings of Flavius Josephus, which which comes about in the first century, him and Philo, Judaeus, second temple, and the Bar Kokhba letters, second century CE. It will be shown that in all these sources, which admittedly witness the different strands of Judaism spanning a millennium, the cycle of festivals remains strongly anchored in what? The agricultural cycle. That's why I said that if you don't factor in the crops, you cannot determine what time in the year it is. And if your feast day, uh, not even feast day, excuse me, the first of your year does not begin when the flax and barley are greeting the ear, then you are off. You need to go re-examine and say, what the heck is going on? Okay. Now I'm gonna go to um, I'm gonna go to wait, let me just let me just type this in. Let me just do full moon here. Let me see if I can pull it up right here. Uh, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I think this is it right here. There we go. This is exactly it. All right. This is from Enoch chapter, first Enoch chapter 74, verse three. Okay. An alternative lunar reckoning. Okay. Nugebar proposed the following translation for the verse. And in steps of fractions of seventh 
literally single seventh parts. The full moon is completed in the east and in steps or fractions of sevenths, complete darkness is reached in the west. Aldo Nugabire does not indicate which particular manuscripts he follows. His translation clearly suggests a sequential observation of waxing and waning of the moon, which is consistent with the material presented in 1st Enoch 73, a state of affairs which should be expected in the light of the preceding chapter where the lunar month starts with the sighting of what? The first crescent. This situation is reversed if one follows the translations of either Isaac or Neb. So these are three different scholars that are translating the book of Enoch. The preponderance of the evidence is on Isaac and Neb. Let's see what it says. Following a different manuscript, Isaac's translation suggests the moon wanes. That means it goes from light to dark in 15 steps during a period of 15 days and waxes going from dark to light in 14 steps in the east and the west, respectively. Neb translates in seven parts, it makes all its darkness full. And in seven parts, it makes all its light full, either in the east or west. And the most recent translation of date, Nicholsburg, Van de Kamp suggests in one seven part, it completes all its light in the east and in the west. And it says both the Isaac and Neve translation mentioned the waning of the moon first. Isaac follows manuscript A and indicates in his notes the alternative reading of manuscript C, which agrees with Nugabar's translation. Clearly, the Isaac Neb line of translation marks a contrast with the preceding chapters as regards the mode of observation of the lunar month from its start to its end in a sequential manner. Following chapter 73, one would assume an observation based on a cycle of first crescent waxing of the moon until full moon, then waning of the moon until new moon. Rather, in both Isaac and Neb, one is left with the impression that the observation started at full moon and not the new moon, thus observing first for 15 days, the waning of the moon until its total darkness. The second part of the observation concerns itself with the waxing of the moon in 14 steps, presumably and logically from the sighting of the first crescent until its waxing culminates in the full moon. This description is inconsistent with the preceding chapter where the lunar month unmistakably starts with the new moon. Admittedly, there are a number of variant sources upon which the translators base their words as recognized by New Geber. Uh, excuse me, New Gebauer himself. It seemed tempting to utilize in this commentary to the astronomical chapters of the Book of Enoch, the numerous parallels and variants found in the Ethiopic Computus Treatises. The problem is we can't use the Dead Sea source because that's in fragments, okay? So we have to go to the Ethiopic manuscripts, but there's also Slavonic manuscripts as well. So they use the, the, the uh, tatters that we get uh, or fragments we get from the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had the Ethiopic manuscripts, and you had the Slavonic manuscripts. These are the three manuscript text types that exist that represents the Book of Enoch. He goes to say, since, however, practically all these texts are unpublished, and since only a detailed study could bring about and relative completeness to this huge mass of material, I have usually abstained from referring to such secondary sources, though they may well contain information more reliable than the Book of Enoch in its present condition. I made good use, however, of the possibility of discussing my interpretations of the text with Professor Ephraim Isaac at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. The statement suggests that, indeed, there are a great many possible translations, as there are a great many variants which could well be more reliable, which he didn't use. It is, of course, way beyond the scope of the present study to embark upon such a task as that suggested here by Nugabauer. This must be left to others. However, a few points can be made at this stage. The first is that despite the best efforts of the translators, translations necessarily limit the possible meaning of a text in comparison to what the sum of the sources might have implied. Second, in a treatise like the Book of Luminaries, the editorial choice of the translator can potentially alter the overall meaning and content of the work. This is evident from the discrepancy of translation in 1 Enoch 74 exemplified above. Third, this somehow distorted picture will necessarily color with a bias any reconstruction of the socio-religious context of the milieu in which a work emerged, in this instance, that of the late 3rd century BCE Palestinian Judaism. Fourth, this distorted picture will also influence any investigation that will rely in part upon the source in its translated form or, for that matter, in the original languages. Back to 1 Enoch 74 and 3. I'm almost done. 
The new Gebauer translation makes good sense as it fits perfectly with the description of chapter 73. The Isaac Neem line highlights the awkwardness of two differing manners of describing observations. Here, the curiosity of the textual critic is awakened following an important criterion of textual criticism when faced with two conflicting versions of the same narrative, the most awkward passage may be believed to be what? What does that say, brother? To be the more ancient in the tradition. So there are various methods of textual criticism, and that's why you got to sign up for the classes. We're going to delve into textual criticism. I'm going to make it very plain for y'all and give you all the sources if you want to go deeper into textual criticism, right? Actually, that's one of the, the steps that we go through in our methodology, right? But in textual criticism, there's two different rules that I use a lot against apologists, right? The first rule is lectio brevior or brevior lectio, which means the shorter reading is the preferred reading. And then you have another one where it's the most awkward passage is believed to be the more ancient in tradition. Why? Because typically when you see a random awkward passage, which we find a lot in the Tanakh, by the way, that is just randomly there, you know, like the one that says, don't boil your kid in his mother's milk. That just randomly jumps in the book of Leviticus. It just pops up in, in the middle of another conversation that's being had. It's like, what, why, where did this come from? It's because it is a very, very ancient tradition. The translation by Neb and Isaac indicates an awkward passage in the middle of the context of the calendrical or astronomical chapters of Enoch because in chapter 73, it is, it is unmistakably talking about the the uh, waxing of the moon indicating the beginning of the month until the 15th day and from the 15th day all the way until the end of the month. However, here, the preponderance of the evidence for the scholars, two major scholars of the three major scholars who do work on this, two scholars over the one says that no, the way it should be rendered in Ethiopic indicates that it's talking about the waning of the moon at the beginning of the month. And whenever you have that, that is something very peculiar. You get in textual criticism where whatever is the most awkward passage is indicated as the most ancient. And when you continue to read this, which I'm not going to continue to read because it's like another couple of pages, but it's letting you know that if the translation by the preponderance of the evidence or the scholars, the majority of scholars or the consensus that says it should be read like this, it's just there randomly when we have the previous chapters talking about the dark moon being the, being the new moon then that means we have to reckon that it's talking about the full moon being the more ancient tradition. And the reason why it's not touched by the uh, authors of the text is because that would be sacrilegious to cross out, erase, or delete something that comes from an older, more ancient tradition. So this is the evidence that we have on our side in regards to the full moon being an ancient tradition representing something that the Israelites did prior to the adoption of the previous chapter, which is chapter 73, of the crescent conjunction moon. Now, that's if people care about textual criticism, if they care about uh, the scholarly consensus, if they care about any of these things. If you care about that, then the evidence weighs on the side of the full moon being the more ancient tradition. That's something else that you can use in regards to your research. Absolutely. Okay. I would definitely... Uh... To me, you would have to. Well, and I don't want to take up too much time, but to me, you you would have to rely on the textual criticism because that's what all the translators would have done with each different translations over time, anyway. So, okay, yeah. So I appreciate your time, Tyrone. Thank you for giving your feedback. Let me move on to other people that's on the stage um, before it gets too late. Um, if you have any additional questions or anything like that, you can leave them in the chat. Or well, the next time I go live, if we need to bring this up again for more um, soundness, because we have another live stream before we, we when when we actually do the feast days um, in my group, right? I'll go over it again. I'll make this week and next week. I'll just dedicate it to the feast days and various conversations in regards to the feast days. Okay. Definitely, I appreciate it. All right, King. Appreciate your time. All right. So next, we're gonna go to Jordan Campbell. Shalom, Jordan. Thank you for waiting patiently. Um, the floor is yours. Shalom, Mariah. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you, my brother. Awesome. Um, I kind of had a, a question that was kind of off topic. So, disrespect the platform. Can you hear me? Yeah, you said it was off topic. Yeah, it was off topic. And I didn't want to disrespect your platform and ask something that, you know, you're not really focused on right now. So I was wondering if I. Could... Uh, okay, it, it depends on what it is. Is it something that's going to require extensive dialogue or extensive feedback on my part? Or is it something real quick that we can. It's discuss? pretty quick, I'd say. Okay, so go ahead. I'll let you ask it, my brother. You waited, so I'll, I'll let you ask it. Awesome. I appreciate you, Mari. Um, you did a previous live stream where you were talking about West African ancestry linking them to the Israelites and you brought out a reference in uh about an ambibio man and he had a figurine that represented his semitic ancestor i don't know if you remember that well you're you're muted aki you're uh you're muted i can't hear you my bad. I was gonna say yes. I've mentioned that in a previous uh, live stream some time ago. Well, that's a that's a very nuanced detail that you picked up. <laughs> on. That is that goes to show you paying attention to everything. But yes, I referenced that some time ago, a couple of years ago, um, in regards to that primary source, and I was I, I was putting it in a a second wave of uh, presentations where I will go more in detail in regards to the Black Jew. This is what they're termed historically. Uh, presence in Western Central Africa and evidences for this understanding amongst the people groups in Western Central Africa. Yes, I was hoping that you can give me the and my heart is to find it and I can't find a live stream. I and... paid money for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I paid, I paid a lot of money to get that source because it came from a book that was not published anymore and it cost me a couple hundred dollars just to read the book. See, when I get when I get contributions, what do you think I spend it on? R and D, research and development. I, I I research, I buy books, I read them, and or I pay for books online. I have access to at least six, seven different academic libraries, and I just go searching through stuff, right? And I and I came upon this, and I was like, oh, so I got the abstract, but I was like, man, I need I need to have the rest of the article. So I paid, I think it was a hundred and something dollars just to get the book. And I was like, wow, I got it. It's unpublished. I couldn't get it from a library. I couldn't get it from Barnes and Nobles. I couldn't get it from Mary. Amazon said that it was out of print. So I couldn't get it from Amazon either. That was the only place I could get it from. And it cost me money, but it was worth it because nobody ever presented that source in our community before in regards to this. So I'm going to have to look for that again. I had the presentation somewhere. I had it scheduled for like after the summer in the second half of this year to actually present it. Um, and if I find it, uh, this weekend, I'll give it to you, or whenever I have the time to grab it, just shoot me an email to kingdomharbinger at gmail.com. When I get it, I'll just send it to you. I don't even awesome. think I put it in the Patreon yet either. Interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll drop it in the Patreon too if anybody else is interested in getting it, but I'll send it to you directly and I'll drop it in the Patreon uh, when I come across it again in my presentation. But yeah, thank you for paying attention, brother. Like, wow. That yeah, makes me feel good that people really care <laughs> what stuff that I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I've listened. Yeah. I, I trust me, I, I know a lot about the nuanced things you talked about. But um, another question that just popped in my mind, too, and that's kind of on topic is um, Ola Uda Equiano. When you talk about his uh, commentary on the Ebos practices, uh, if I remember correctly, he did talk about them celebrating a full moons. Yes. Um, would you say that that would be a Semitic inclusion or a tradition that followed them from Israel? Or it do could. You say? Yeah, yeah, but uh, Olodu Equiano, he was not saying that he was a Jew, right? What he was, as you know, as he was doing was he was parsing out the customs and practices amongst the Nigerians uh, or the Igbo at that time and the Jews. And because he saw so many equivalent connections between the two, his proposal was there was a common ancestor at some point back that they splintered from, right? So what I teach is that there was Semites known as Black Jews that did migrate from the East and settle amongst uh, the coast of Western Central Africa because they they were merchants, right? And they dealt a lot with anything that dealt with trade and things along those nature. That's what follows a lot of the Jews as they leave because they don't have an established land that is their own. 
So mer being in the field of merchants, being that you travel to and fro, you can move work. That's what we, we say now. They were like the plug. They can move work. You know what I'm saying? So when they go and they settled on the western central coast of Africa, and then some of them was also in the hinterland, they left little things here and there, remnants here and there, that was an indicator to the primary sources of people that went into these regions and they saw these groups. They left these residue there amongst them, the ones who identify as black Jews or the ones that were singled out as being black Jews, amongst them as indicators that these groups settle amongst the people. But because over time you have acculturation, cultural diffusion and enculturation, they became grouped amongst each other and looked exactly alike. It's the same way when you have Jews that go to Europe and they live there for hundreds and hundreds of years. After a while, they look just like the people there. Right. And this is something that is a common trend amongst Jews in the diaspora. Right. So in regards to his reference, when he was making reference to all these things that were similar to the Jews and their festivals and their practices like circumcision, eighth day, stuff like that. What I would say is that what, what he is identifying is remnants of Semitic infusion in his region at some point in the past, either through contact or either the people, you know, I guess from some period of time lived amongst them for so long, they just became the same people as the people they were amongst. And then you had a lot of crypto Jews that lived there and the works of Janice Levy, she writes about this, right? Beyond the Saharan cloak. And she writes about the crypto Jews that lived amongst the West and, and Central Africans and kind of hid a lot of that identity internally out of fear of persecution for Mohammedism and all the local tribes that existed in their region, right? So what he's talking about is these remnants that's left by this Semitic infusion, like something similar to what you said that he's identifying. Now, he's not saying that the Igbo are Jews, like, like the Jews in his day that he was comparing them to. Because remember, uh, Equiano had converted to Christianity, right? He was a Christian. So he would have had contact with Jews and he would have been familiar with their practices and would have had that social memory amongst him and a few other the Igbo that he was around of what their practices was when he was back in the land because he was 10 years old, eight to 10 years old when he was taken. So this is something that he's been brought up since day one. And that's how he's able to remember it through rote memorization, how they do their practices and so forth. So I would say that that is definitely evidence of some kind of Semitic infusion because whenever you don't have a myth aligned with a custom, then that, that custom came from some other region, came from somewhere else. It was external to the people group. For example, if they start talking about in Sub-Saharan Africa, they start talking about uh, famines or they start talking about a wilderness. Well, you don't see or experience that in Igbo land. It, there's no such thing as that. They, they have enough foliage and forestry that can supply them. So if they have an oral tradition that has that in there, it's not native to that region. It came from somewhere else and infused its way into that region, right? So that's why I would say that he was identifying according to the work that he wrote, the interesting life and narrative of uh, Oludua uh, Equiano. Awesome, awesome. Um, I think that's it for me right now, but I just wanna say uh, thank you for providing great information and breadcrumbs that we can follow because I definitely pick up on a lot of stuff and research a lot of stuff that you reference and um, stuff and information that's not common in our community. I love stuff like that. So I just yeah. want to thank you so much. Thank you, Moray. And trust and believe I do research and look into everything you reference and and, and point to. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. That made my evening knowing that, my brother. So <laughs> if you ever need anything, just shoot me an email. We'll take care of you. Okay. Awesome. All right. Have a good evening. You too, King. Shalom. All right. Uh, thank you for that, my brother. Next up, we have my brother, Emmanuel. Hey, if y'all didn't see the event that was live streamed, when was that? That was uh, on Sunday, last Sunday. Y'all missing out. I don't know how you made it here and you didn't get to watch that live stream. That live stream was powerful. And what this brother brought out is game changing, right? So, my brother Emmanuel, the floor is yours, King. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, appreciate you, Ock, man, for that opportunity to even uh, be there 
and uh, to to even be blessed myself. It was a it was a great meeting, man, and uh, I'm so glad that I was part of it. Um, so I just wanted to um, kind of like bring 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 to light a few things, and then also to ask uh, a few questions. First of all, in concerning the topic, um, I realized because while you were talking, I don't know if it was. Uh, a, I'm not sure. I just wanted to clarify, but I think from when you go to Exodus 11, right, or Exodus chapter 10, when the darkness, I realized that the darkness was actually the ninth plague. So that means it was only one more plague after that, which is the, you know, firstborn plague. So it was actually the ninth plague. And then when you go to um, That's correct. I think I think I misspoke when I said twelve, but it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I, I just knew it. Yeah. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. See, this so, is when you have good students that can teach you. <laughs> you got it. <brother. laughs> I'm not there yet, and, man. And hold, I, and hold you accountable. <laughs> please hold me accountable. If I misspeak, please, because you know some other apologists will jump in, some other random Israelite that don't like me, they'll come in, they'll correct me. But it's good to be corrected internally first, so I can Appreciate deal with that. whatever heat comes afterwards. But you got it, my brother. Go ahead. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. So when you go to, yeah, so just having that, looking at that, you can see that immediately after that play, which you showed that there's no way that it will be a miracle if it was three days of darkness, if there was no moon at night. There's no way it's a miracle. You know, if it's a, if it's a, you know, a miracle, then that means that the moon was out. And then after that, we noticed at the same time that in the land of Goshen, there was light. You know, so having that in mind, you can see that from verse, um, the whole chapter 11 kind of talks about the fact that yet one more plague, like from verse one, I will bring upon Pharaoh and, and upon Egypt. Then when you go to 12, that's when he begins to talk about, uh, you know, on the 10th day. So they were doing this. It looks like this instruction was in Egypt. That, as I'm seeing this instruction right here, because... It, this is the same place where he says uh, they should eat it standing. And that's the only time where they actually did it stand, you know, you know, because that's that's when they were actually leaving. So that means that they actually did have time. And when you notice 14 days from that, so they had to go ask for things from the, you know, Egyptians, all that, you know, and then get a lamb on the 10th day fatten it up, you know, before the 14th day and all that. So I think it all adds up and lines lines up with the fact that, you know, it was a full moon, you know, on the on on the beginning of months. So that's that that's fascinating that I was noticed. The other yeah. thing that I was going to notice is yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to add something real quick. So what's fascinating is that from the ninth plague all the way into to chapter uh 12, some period of time is elapsing. Right. The Correct. text doesn't give us this explicitly, but there's some more dialogue that's going on. Now I can see if you didn't have a chapter 11, right, where something is threatened, that means it's looming. Right. That means some time is passing and you went straight from darkness to Passover. Then exactly. I would say, OK, you know what? Then you, you you may have a point in regards to what, what you're saying in regards to Passover happening on the full moon. Right. Exactly. However, because some time is elapsing from the three days of darkness and you you get in towards the darkness. Uh, as you get closer to the feast day, when they exited out, something very peculiar occurred. And I'm going to pull this up real quick okay. um, on Exodus chapter 13, starting at verse 17. Right. And uh, and I've shared this before, but I'll pull it out again. And it says right here, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, Elohim did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. And I went over this before to talking about the way of Heru. Right, which is a passage along the coastal plains that the kings of Egypt took when they went into uh, Canaan land, right, or the Levant. Although that was near, for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led them, uh, led the people around by the way of the wilderness towards the sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, verse 20, and they move on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham, on the edge of the wilderness, in verse 21, and Yah went before them by day in a pillar mm. of cloud to lead them along the way, but by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Mm. 
So that means when they're leaving out, it's a dark moon because typically you can use the moon to navigate directions or orient you with direction you're going. You can use the moon for navigation. Well, if the moon is not full and it's, let's say, a conjunction or a first visible crescent, you can't use the moon to know what direction you're going at night. Typically, most travels occur when there's a full moon or a gibbous or a crescent that's light enough for people to know what direction to go. But if you're in the beginning stages of your conjunction moon or your first visible crescent, you don't have enough light from the moon to navigate at night. But if Yah's giving them a pillar of fire to give them light at night, it says that they may what? Travel by day and by night. Wow. <laughs> they don't need the use of the moon anymore because, again, it wouldn't be lit according to what we're saying. They would mm -hmm. use the fire to guide them. And that would that would make sense because that's them relying on Yah to get them where they need to go. It's out of their own power, out of their own hands, out of their own observations. Their full reliance is on Yah to get them in the direction in which he decides to take them. Right. Absolutely, so, man. So that's Absolutely. that's that's that right there is good. All right, so you got it, brother. I didn't mean to cut you off. You got your next. No, no, no. that's 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 I, I, you know, that's that's great. You know, that's that's some real fire right there, some nuggets to add, you know, to this understanding. But I also just wanted a point which was very fascinating that I kind of just, um, you know, noticed. I think I was trying to uh, share that with you on Sunday was the fact that this menological, sacerdotal, um, reckoning of time. Um, uh, which you brought forth that KHM actually observes falls in this. So our Passover falls right on the day of the uh, solar eclipse that's going to happen. The solar eclipse is going to happen on the 8th. Our calendar falls right on that day. That's fascinating. You know, because when I thought about it, I was like, wow. Man, this is, and we do know, you mentioned it already, you said it a lot of times, that the solar eclipse is, is a sign. It's all, all over the scriptures. It says, you know, the moon will be dark, the sun will not give, you know, these are signs. And you also mentioned that they're also like omens, you know, and things like that. So it's very, very fascinating that of all the calendars, the Passover, on the day when, you know, it's it, where we know this it, it, through, through the scriptures following uh the, the you know th this calendar that it'll be dark on that date that it there's an an eclipse of you know a solar eclipse it's just i, I don't know th th i don't know you, you got anything else you know more to say about that i mean you know and and um this is interesting because i see in the chat that key ron is actually bringing it up and brendan blackwell had mentioned that in regards to you know this new doctrine coming out about the days of darkness the time of darkness is coming and all of this stuff is supposed to be happening on that day and it's interesting that those theories are coming out on the day that Yah set apart for this reckoning of time and keeping the passover unleavened bread it's very fascinating that's happening Typically, uh, when you see a, a solar eclipse, um, those are omens, but a solar eclipse on a feast day hmm. is, is too much of a coincidence. So yeah. what could that mean? Typically, a lot of prophecies um, have, in this, especially like the book of Joel and a lot of the what they call the minor prophets make reference to the moon being dark or given no light. Right. And typically that indicates that something major is going to happen in regards to the Israelites. But we never see any mention, at least from the recordation from the text, about a dark moon by way of an eclipse uh, occurring on a feast day. Hmm. That's something that the text never references. And I think that we're going to have to wait and see what occurs after that period of time happens. Right. Um, I don't I don't profess to be no no fortune teller or Absolutely. no prophet that can see the future. I can only simply give my speculation because these are two different things that is very significant according to scripture that are now conversing at the same yes. time in what, another week or so, right? Yep. So there's going to be a very phenomenal time to be alive. We're about to see what, what takes place. We already saw the collapsing of that bridge, right? Mm -hmm. In Maryland, right? I don't know what that indicates. Maybe that points to something, but we're going to see a lot of things that's about to occur. So I'm, I'm just holding my horses, getting ready for the ride. Wow. Yeah. 
Now, even though, like I said, you you already said that too. I don't know about the three days of darkness or anything. However, it's very clear about the solar eclipse. It's there, you know, and we know that that just shows that things are about to happen. We don't know. Just like you said, I don't know either, you know, but it just shows that you just got to watch and see because things are about to happen. Um, I also wanted to um, ask a, like a question, like for um, what what particular... Um, what particular um, calendar or reckoning of time that is used that people call the Zadokite calendar? Uh, is it just one or are they different yeah. kinds? So that's typically uh, related to uh, the Qumran cave, right, community, the Yahad community. Mm -hmm. um and because the zadokites were believed to also have uh lived in kuram right so um it, if somebody's saying that they could either be referring to one of two things either either one um a zadokite calendrical model that was preserved in babylonian captivity because that was the priesthood that was in captivity in babylon or they could be referring to the break off from that zadokite sect of priesthood um, going and residing in the uh, Qumran caves, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on who we speak to, um, mm -hmm. but you'll get a different answer depending upon what they're referencing in regards to that. But yeah, it could be either one of those two. It just be, it would just depend on the individual who okay. who's mentioning. Yeah, yeah, I kind of noticed that, and I think that they're you know I've heard a lot, and it looks like the calendars are not even the same as well, even though they still mention as it the Zadokite calendar. Yeah. Though the one that I did hear does mention the you know the Qumran caves and the Essenes, you know, in the Qumran caves and everything. Uh, what do you think about them actually using Ezekiel, or is it a is it Ezekiel? I think it's Ezekiel forty five, or is it a or is it Isaiah forty five that you know where it talks about the Zadokites and then using that to infer. That that means that they got the calendar right because it talks about the Zadokites, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, not being wrong, or not. Um, um, I think it, it it shows. Do you know the scripture that I'm I'm, I'm trying to? I, I do. Yeah, I do, but I don't know where it's at offhand. If somebody in the chat does know think exactly what it is, either forty five yeah. or forty four. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ezekiel. You'll see what you'll see in regards to this. So the Zadokite lineage is very important to the yeah. Qumran community, right? They even have a Zadokite document amongst the extra biblical texts uh, amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Um, the Zadokite lineage that resided in Qumran is believed to be responsible for what we get the the Nakian calendar, right? The generation of the Nakian calendar that they they had the ancient path. Right. And that, mm -hmm. you know, when they reserved themselves to the Kurum caves, they started to write those things down. Right. So mm -hmm. they, you know, being that they are a priestly lineage that has been sanctioned by Yah, they believe that because they resided at Qumran, the calendar system that you get there, it's this, the entity responsible for it is the Zadokite priesthood. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why they do that to give credence to their calendrical model. Right. Um, so my thing is a lot of the stuff that we have is late, right? Yep. So the question is, how do we reconstruct what's ancient? I gave you one of those methods in textual criticism, looking at these three different manuscripts representing the Ethiopic version of the book of Enoch and where the consensus weighs on that the rendering you see in first Enoch 74 should be talking about the full moon being the new moon and that that being an ancient tradition older than That's the right. conjunction or FVC in the previous chapter being the new moon, right? So that right there is a very, very stark contrast to what those believe that at that time, and we're talking about, you know, after Alexander the Great dies in 332, then you have, uh, well, dies after 32 but then you have his successors the seleucids right and the ptolemies that arise up and they spreading this doctrine of hellenism right and the reckoning of time is based on the chaldean practices of babylon right this all to them knowing this history and then seeing with the greeks being bold and disrespecting the jews their objective is like whoa we gotta 
we got to fix this. Like they messed everything up. We got to fix this, right? Again, if you're fixing or adjusting something, then what is the emphasis on what things were prior? This is why we read the book of Jubilees. The emphasis is on the day of Jubilee. That is the air of the, the, the day of reckoning. It's going to happen on a Jubilee. Matter of fact, talking about this solar eclipse happening during this feast day, depending on some counts, this year is a Jubilee year too. Mm. Which is which is really interesting because you got yeah. a Jubilee year, you got an eclipse. And you got a feast day, and they all form around the same time. Wow. That's very fascinating, right? Um, and that's something I'll try to bring up probably next Friday, right? About uh, some re some sources say that this year, from the count from when those sources were written about 12, 13 years ago, that this would be considered a Jubilee year as well, right? So the Jubilee year is very critical and crucial to those who subscribe to the Kurum community sex, uh, you know, their customs. However, that stuff happened after the Greeks come on the scene. Yeah. So we're trying to reconstruct something older than that. Exactly. So first use the primary source, which is the textual data we get. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. Out of all the passages that read from what can be recovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the only one that we have fully extent is the book of Isaiah, right? But for everything else that we have that exists for all the scriptures that I referenced, Psalm 81 and 3, et cetera, what we have for those passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they don't vary. They stay the same exact thing, mm. which is fascinating because it's like, okay, if it says this and we are examining the textual data in 2024 and they've examined the textual data during, just say, two, uh, 200 BCE, right, uh, 150 BCE, then why are there different interpretations? And also, remember, this sect was not in Jerusalem. You had Jerusalem sects that came from out of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Zealots. But the Pharisees and Sadducees represented the Jerusalem sects, and the Essenes represented the sect that, that stayed away from the uh, Jerusalem because they be believed that Jerusalem was defiled because of the Greeks and this heavy idolatry there and what was being kept by those priests in Jerusalem was against the law. That's why they're seen separate themselves. And then eventually we see those sects reside in Qumran, right? Who are completely separate from Jerusalem. So you have three different perspectives. You have our modern perspective, user and textual data, and experts in that field to interpret and reconstruct what the ancient, most ancient tradition is. And then we have the interpretation by means of the teacher of righteousness and his scribes in Qumran, and then the Pharisees and their scribes in Jerusalem. Very fascinating. So we yeah. have to take all of that into account when we reckon time to say, okay, which one of them represents the most ancient reckoning of time? And you'll see the most awkward parts point to something that is contrary to what was adopted by the Jews. And remember, this adoption happened when they was in exile. So that's when the name started changing, right? Which is very fascinating. All of a sudden you change the name of the months. You're talking about times and stuff being changed in the book of Daniel. Hey, they... The Jews adopted the change of times while they was in captivity. Why would they do that? Mm -hmm. And the emphasis in Daniel is about the times changing and the law changing because of the beast and so forth and the ten horns and the horn to come out of that. Like, I would, I, if I was them at that time, I would go back to the pre-exilic model and say, hey, let's go back to the ancient ways of reckoning time. So right. there, right there, if we have a situation where the months change, and then the reckoning of time will change to keep in alignment with those months because it's not their calendrical system. Yeah. They're using an exilic calendrical system, which would be yeah. in contrast to the pre-exilic calendrical system. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay, brother. You, I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah. You can close out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, yeah. I think I found a scripture that says in Ezekiel 44, okay. 15, where it says, but the Levitical priest, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge oh, well, of my what's sect? The, what's the scripture again? Let me Ezekiel put on the screen. For, Ezekiel 44, verse 15. Okay, Ezekiel 44, 15. Hold on one second. Let me bring it up. Right. Ezekiel 44, 15? Yeah. Okay. All right, let me bring it up. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, go ahead, my brother. So it says, but the... The Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, 
shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares Yahuwah, our Elohim, our power. So they kind of use this to show that, okay, since we had, you know, sons of Zadok, even amongst the Essenes, they couldn't be wrong, as if to say like they were infallible. Correct. Even though, even though we can tell, we can see by records that they were also trying to reconcile the calendar. Correct. You know, and found out at a particular time that the, the, the seasons were also falling out of the calendar in which they were using, the, you know, the priestly. Um, um, yeah. So when you see that, I was just trying to, you know, see, I, I can't see how this scripture can be used to validate the fact that a certain people cannot have flaws or cannot make make mistakes and things like that, even though we have it on record that they did have and were trying to. Um, so here's the know. thing, right? Also, that's very interesting. If if the calendar found in Quram is representative of the ancient calendar, then the issue you have is that there were multiple calendrical texts that were utilized and abandoned at Qumran. Wow. <laughs> and they all were based off of the Anakian calendar because what they realized is that that calendrical system of 364 days is going to leave you a day and some change. So after seven years, you're going to be back a whole week, eight yep. days probably, a whole eight days. And if you continue on, you'll be back two weeks, 14 years. Then you'll be back longer than that. Uh, about 28 30, years, 30 years back a, that's a whole month. month. Yeah, then you back a whole month and then you yeah. keep going. And that's why when I referenced um GOCC, GOCC back in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is when uh, or 2013 is when Elder Ricard decided that they're gonna follow a version of the Kanakian calendar. Mm -hmm. Now they're having Passover in the beginning of March. What what how do you have how do you have Passover? near the beginning of march wow that means over time because they're going they're going back in time that means if you give them another 14 years 28 years they're going to be in february having passover oh, oh, is that going to be no barley or flax outside in israel right you're going to still have the wintry rains you're going to have no turtle doves flying into the land they're going to they, they're going to keep going back in time and so somebody realizes oh shoot something happened so with the calendrical system scholars have said that Amongst the Qumran community, the only way they were able to reckon, and again, there's no proof of this. So this is something that they're speculating. The only way they were able to reckon that recession in time is by using the seventh year and adding a intercalary system of seven days, representing wow. the, um, the year of Jubilee. So they add an extra week to their calendar which technically will help to reset things and keep it back in sync with the seasons. So it's right? no more empirical. Correct. Now, some people will say, oh, no, the Ikanakian calendar starts the same day every year. You can start Wednesday every year, but guess what? Wednesday has a different number on the Gregorian calendar every year. Mm. So if you say that Wednesday begins, let's say March 28th is a Wednesday, the following year, March 28th is not going to be a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The year after that, it's not going to be a Wednesday. So you're going to have to choose another day that's a Wednesday. And typically, it's another day that goes, that recesses in time, that recedes in time, as opposed to staying in sync with the calendrical model that has 365 and a quarter and some change days, right? So that would be another conversation with somebody that I know that actually holds on to that. Um, I'm going to say this real quick. So Elda Adum, I shared the link. You can click on it and you can join the panel discussion if you like that's why i put the link in the chat for you okay scott told you you can hit the link elder hit the link and you can join i don't have a problem with you speaking on this matter this is this was an open panel discussion so you could definitely do that so yeah emmanuel thank you for your time my brother let me thank just get you, on man. to the next i'm gonna say something that's very interesting the brother deroyahu ben dora who's also on the panel he is a fan of the Zadokites. That's my good brother. That brother is very insightful. He brings out nuances and stuff. So I learn sometimes when he speaks and we, you know, we exchange information, right? But he's a subscriber of the Zadokite line. Gotcha. So you, you're going to hear him. And he's done this, spoke about this before. You're going to hear him speak about this. If he if he's still on the, plan, on the uh, panel, he's going to mm -hmm. talk about the Zadokites. You'll see. That's a good representation if you want to know that perspective that you just mentioned. He's mm -hmm. going to use Ezekiel 4415 as well. And he's mm -hmm. going to come out and say that the Zadokites were able to maintain the true calendrical model. 
right? And that's mm-hmm. why wherever they're at, where they're settled, wherever they're, they're responsible for putting it forth, that's why we should subscribe to what they say because we read this in Ezekiel 44 and 15, mm-hmm. right? So it's very, no, very coincidental that he's here right after you said something about the Zadokite. <laughs> Fascinating. Appreciate you, Akka. Appreciate you. Anytime, King. Oh. All right, shalom. All right, shalom. All right, my brother Dara Yahu, are you there, my brother? I'm here, my brother. I okay. came to You said what? Oh, actually, uh, can you hear me clearly? I can. I can hear you. It's a little. It sounds a little muffled, but I can. I can make out what you're saying. Uh, hold on. Give me a second. Let me okay. fix this. Is that better or is it still the same? It's still the same, but I can hear you. Go ahead, brother. I can hear you. How about the chat? Can you hear me? Um, Hit one if you can hear the brother chat. Hit one if you can hear him. Hit one if you can hear him. Because I can hear him. So hit one if you can hear him. Okay. They're saying they can hear you, brother. Go ahead. You got it. Okay, cool. Um, uh, First off, um, man... <laughs> Um, uh, peace to you, um, Dr. Safania, you and your fam, a uh, peace and blessings to the chat. Um, I have so many questions in regards to this. this, this <laughs> I podcast. already know. I already know you do. <laughs> right. We've been over this before. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's ooh, okay, but I'll start with this though, right? Because, um, uh, two things. Uh, first off, in regards to you know um, to uh, to using the annual course of the moon to celebrate the Sabbath. I mean, not the Sabbath, but the uh, the feast days, right? And it's and it's um, in our community. Uh, the common sentiment is, is is that we have to use it, right? And there are a lot of there's a lot of scriptures that are brought up, you know, to support it, right? Like Psalms 104 and 19, for, um, for example, right? Um, can you put up on the screen real quick? Cause I wanna, I wanna. Touch on I, got that. I got you, I got you, hold on one second. All right. Because it's something that um, I think we missed. Um, but you know what? Let me bring it up. Let me bring it up um, here. And the reason I'm asking is because of this. Because, okay, like, um, why are you doing that? It's like, okay, for me, in my research, um, um, the list of the holy days that are in um in Leviticus twenty three, I numbers chapter twenty eight to twenty nine and Deuteronomy and also in Exodus, right? And especially in Leviticus twenty three, right? <clears throat> All the holy days um are set in, are set in the agriculture season of the year. Mainly two. Mainly two from my observations. Um in the spring and in the fall. Four, the first four in the spring, other three in the fall. Right. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why, um, um, in regards to my first uh, um, concern, in regards to in regards to Psalms one four nineteen, is because that in the list, um, especially in the Vigor twenty three, is that. None of these holy days fall on the Sabbath, right? And there's no provision or any um, any talking of or any like um, any um, 
in the provision to say, okay, what do we do when, you know, the they were coming for all on Sabbath, right? Or even like the or even like raising Omer or yeah. or um or um or the feast of weeks because in the text it says that both, you know, are the raising of Omer or wait or the raising of the sheath or uh and the Shavuot, both of them, um, it says that there are, you know, observed on the day after the Sabbath, which would be the first day of the week, right? So, now in regards to Psalms 104 and 19, right, um, where it says, um, it says, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, it says, I'm going to say, 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 for festivals, right? Or translations mm-hmm. made more for should be Moed, yeah, Moedim, which is the yeah, annual battle. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's my my contention, right? Because I'm like, okay, okay, since if that is true, right, that that our God made the moon for the celebrations of I already know where you're getting at. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's why you oh, used the to it earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the celebration of the holy days, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, if that is true, then um, how is it that the annual course of the moon is not in sync with the agriculture season of the year in which our holy days are set in, right? Mm-hmm. So, ask myself a hard question. I say, okay, all right. So, like, at the term I want deep, right? Um, the main focus it it in the interpretation it seems to be on this on the word more right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which, which is um in its a masculine plural form right? right but it's also in its um absolute form right being uh, general, correct right which which then it's also um, uh, attributed or or related to the same word in in Leviticus twenty three. I think uh, right. verses like two and three mm-hmm. or, or four, right? Mm-hmm. But how but how are the um, how are the word form is different in these two texts? Because here in Psalms one four nineteen, the first half of the verse it's it's more ding, right? Mm-hmm. Right, but and um. In Leviticus, it's it's more Leviticus, day. A, a Leviticus, yeah, day would be the construct form, right? Right. So with right. The, with the nere and yod. So wait, what right. verse, what verse in Leviticus are you referring to? I think it's uh, verse uh, either three or four. Three or four. Let's see. Yeah. Right, because um, here's my contention. My gripe with this is, is that okay. These are two different um, word forms, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. one is in its ab- absolute form, right? Um, masculine plural, right? Um, in the Psalms one four nineteen, but in Leviticus, it's, it's in its um, it's also mas- it's also in its masculine plural form, but here, it's in its construct form, hinting at um, uh, something very specific, and also and also hinting hints at um. Um, oh, right here. It's in verse four. I found it. It's in verse four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now these are two different word forms and set in, in two different contexts, right? Correct. So, okay. So now, um, so okay, I understand. You know how it relates to the uh, to the source to the root meaning of the word. I get it. Mm-hmm. But these are two different word forms. 
Yeah, yeah, one is you mentioned, yeah, one is one is absolute, right? And what yeah, is in a construct because the following nominative or subject is uh, yote vavhe, right? So right, it's showing right. it's a possession of his, it's his annual gathering. Literally, that's right. what it says, right? Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So and that's why it's a difference. Um hence hence the two different word uh word mm -hmm. forms and two different texts. And that's why in verse 23, they're listed here. Whereas in Psalms 104 and 19, it's not listed. Mm -hmm. Hence the generality. So that's what's the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. If that's, mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, then, um, so then, um, and we know, all of us know, and myself, because um, uh, I did used to use the, and of course, the most several days, no cap about that, right? Um, so I ask some hard questions since since we know that the end course of the moon is not in sync with the agricultural season of the year in which our holidays are set in. Mm -hmm. Hence, that's why a lot of us um, try to, you know, that we um, do as a collation, which it's which is not real. It's not true. It's a man-made construct. As, right. as so at um at a group point out um from way back when in, in Mesopotamia it, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't exist at all Correct. right because uh, because the moon um uh, because the annual moon um the annual course of the moon cycle it only goes through twelve constellations only twelve Correct. Correct. and the sun Correct. too right mm -hmm. but also what I mean, yeah, observed yet, and um, uh, is this not only that, but in each and every month, through each of the 12 months of the year, um, and with the mm -hmm. that the moon, each, each of the 12 constellations in every month, in a particular pattern, in a two, two, three meaning. Um, in of the course, right? Um, mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, uh, whether six months that um that begin with a complete dark phase in the moon, or in other six phases, in other six um, that begins in the months where it begins with a a small little. A um uh type of crescent um light on the right side of the moon right those six mm -hmm. months right mm -hmm. um and each they cycle through uh, um the moon cycles through in each of these months what the um i don't want to just explain is that um it cycles through all 12 of the constellations in a two, two, three pattern, meaning that on the first day of each of the month, it arise, it, it will rise in a particular constellation and it's set in the same constellation on day mm -hmm. one. On mm -hmm. day two, it arise in the same constellation as it is in, the, in day one, and it's set in the same constellation um, that it did on day one as well. But day three and day four, it goes to the very next constellation. And day five, day six, and day seven, it arise in, in a difficult place and it do that and it will do that. Um whether it's um in months that have had twenty nine days or thirty days. But anyway, I digress. Um so with so um so with Psalms one of four nineteen, so that's much the question. Since um since the annual course of the moon does not it's not a single with the annual um since the, since the I'm sorry, I'm I'm kinda Moving ahead, moving ahead, and kind of trying to study. Okay, so <clears throat> that since the annual course of the moon is not a thing with the agricultural season of the year, right? Hence, you know, the supposedly uh, 13 month addition, right? Mm -hmm. Every two or three years, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so then, in which you know 
um, the holidays are set and the agriculture is year in which the moon is not in sync with. So that's much of the question then, what is this passage then really talking about? If that's the case, right? And what what is your what is your position in regards to what it's conveying? What is your take on that? Okay. My take on that is this, mm -hmm. and and the second half of the verse is the key, where it says, "Yada shemesh yabo'o." The sun's no, uh, the sun knows when to set, when to go in, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Which which is a a an appointed time of the sun that is that is generally seen by all because everybody sees or knows about the sun setting right right so my position um it also refers to also in regards to the first half of the verse in regards to the moon and mm -hmm. this more thing this mm -hmm. general this this general um Point times on the moon that everybody sees, mm -hmm. and what is that called? You said, "What is it called?" Yeah. Or uh, what are the general appointed times of the moon of the moon that everybody sees? Um, I guess besides the first of the month, depending on what your position is, I would say it would be the fourteenth or fifteenth day of that feast day during the spring, and the same in the fall. One with unleavened bread and one with uh, Sukkot. Hear me out. Hear referring to? No, no, hear me out. Okay, hear me out. Hear me out, Mr. Me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the second cover of the verse of, of Psalm 104 19, right? Mm -hmm. It gives a description of a general hint, a general Correct. upon the time of the sun, which everybody sees. Sun Correct. Head, right? Correct. Right? So then. What are then the the appointed times of the moon that everybody sees? Yeah, generally sees. I mean, that they can physically see. I would say the full moon or the first visible crescent, right? It had to plural. be one of those. It can't be the conjunction moon. No, no. I would say it's the full moon, but yeah. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Is that where you're getting at? No, 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 no. Um, the the appointed times of the moon that everybody sees in the sky, right? Mm -hmm. Just like um, this particular appointed time of the moon that, I mean, of the sun that everybody sees, sunset, right? Mm -hmm. Just one, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in, in the first half of the verse, it's, it's multiple in a general sense that everybody can see. Okay. At the moon's phases. Okay, the people can see the phases. So, so what's the answer to your question? I don't want to keep answering it incorrectly. I just want to know exactly what you're saying. All I'm saying what, is, what is that? What is that that they see every month? You're saying. All I'm saying is that is this is that in Psalms 104 19 in the first uh -huh. half of the verse where it says a Uriah. Um, I say your right? Uh -huh. It's just basically saying that he, meaning God, um, he he made he made the Yerayach, the wanderer, in regards to the at the end course of the moon. He made the moon for phases. The sun knows when to set or when to oh, go. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Okay. So he he so the sun knows when to set, right? Or it's going down, is yeah. its cycle, right? And then the right. moon itself does not set, but it has its own cycle going through the phases, right? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. Um hmm? Okay, so what did I miss? That's what I thought you were saying. <clears throat> I'm saying is that in a sense, yeah, you have what I'm saying is right in regards to the first and second verse, but what I'm saying is I think you um are like are trying to um in a sense trying to say something that I'm not saying but no no that's not my goal. I just that's what I'm saying. 
that's what I thought you just said. But if it's not what you said, just yeah, just explain it to us. You don't have to question me if I'm getting it wrong. Just explain it to us so that we understand what you're saying. Because I thought I, I I followed you. Then you said no. Then you said yes, you got some of it. But then it sounds like I'm misinterpreting you. So I'm just letting you go ahead. I'm just, just yeah, just go and explain it, my brother. Okay, yeah, because, yeah. Um, and the reason I said yes, that's a, um, part of it, right? And maybe it could be me. <laughs> it could be me because um, um, cause maybe I heard you wrong. Could it be? Could be. If that's the case, right? It's okay. Um, just yeah, just explain it to us. Go so, ahead, brother. You got it. So yeah, that's basically that's that's um that's basically all we're saying in regards to that. Um, that so you're saying uh, that we shouldn't use this uh in regards to reckoning time for the feast days. This has nothing to do with it. It's unrelated to Leviticus chapter twenty three. Correct. Exactly because okay, got it. All right. Because um because. Because, like I was saying before, if that was the case, then why would our God set all all the all those appointed times they gave to us in the agriculture season of the year, in which the annual course of the moon is not in sync with? You see what I'm saying? So, and, and another thing too with that, because in doing my research and, and coming to this conclusion in regards to this matter, which I also want to touch on just a little bit in regards to the Kumar community, so-called Kumar, Kumar community, which actually blow my mind when I, um, I'm still making a connection, but. Don't forget to bring up the Zadokites. Make sure I didn't misrepresent you, because I know you <laughs> love them Zadokites. Go ahead, hey, brother. <laughs> it, yeah, it's our folks, man. It's our people, you know what I'm saying? Can't forget about them because um, our ancestors um, who who betrayed them and who who developed this or who who developed what we call the or tradition they forgot about them on purpose. But anyway, um, yeah, because okay, like uh, for instance, right? Okay, uh, like okay. Now, um, okay, so. Keep this right. So, in <clears throat> in Genesis uh, chapter one verse fourteen, what talks about um um in regards to in regards to the point of times, right? And you said that uh, earlier, and as I did before, and as, as I was taught, and as other groups, it's like also teaches that where it says seasons there. Or in some churches, there's a point in time there. It also refers to the annual, the annual um, holy days, right? But the same term there is it, it's more deem. It's in its general, it's in its general masculine plural form, just as it is in, in Psalms one to four and nineteen in regards to the more deem of the moon. Okay, so if that's the case, then how come? How come how come we don't say or how come it's not translated the same way in Daniel in regards to where it says that um uh and I'm paraphrasing uh where it says that for a times uh where for a time, two times and a half where the of the sacrifices and the oblation will be stopped. How come that word right there in the text of Daniel was also more deemed, not translated or even thought about as if as if being interpreted as being referring to the holy days? And I forgot what verse it is because it's in regard to um, the a in regards to the market being revoked, right? Um, so, it's the same term there in Psalms 1419, also in Genesis. So, I'm like, okay, how come we don't interpret it that the same way? You know what I mean?
Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what I'm looking at the text right now. I see what you're saying right here in Daniel. This is Daniel uh chapter 12 and verse 7. Uh, yeah, yeah, so okay, so, yeah. Dean, so yeah, I mean it's in the, it's in this <clears throat> absolute form here as well. Mm -hmm. Um so you're saying why did they not translate this and leave it untranslated? And also meaning, um, also importantly, why we at, um, or, or or our teachers don't even consider, you know, having the same consistent interpretation in regards to where the same word in the same form is found, like is in Genesis or Psalms passage or or here. It's not, it's not interpreted the same. Mm. Different, right? Okay. So what is your yeah. so what's your what's your point with this one here in Daniel then? With this, um, all, all I'm just saying is is that um, grant um, it's it it involves the context in which the form of the word is found in. Okay. Because because um, the past in Genesis in regards to the more things there is in regards to the upon the times of the stars, the sun, and the moon. Correct. Whereas in um in Psalms one to four nineteen, it's only it's only in regards to the upon the times of the moon, which are the are the phases of the moon, which are okay. generally things of all, which is, you know right, but here it's Where's here? Daniel twelve and seven? Yeah. Okay, here is what? But here, in my opinion, um here in my opinion it's it's um it's 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 in regards to the holy days in my opinion it's my opinion here okay it's, it's from here right i mean that um, would that would be in alignment with the context so i don't see i don't see no issue with that um, right and that's yeah and that's, my, and that's my point context in which the form of the word is found in because right because <clears throat> Cause like um um and cause um it's I think it's a matter of um upbringing and 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 our awakening and the uh, the background of our teachers or of from where they came from and it's mainly in my opinion from the aspects of the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. first, right well, yeah i agree with that and you know um in verse 11 uh 12 uh 10 and 11 it says uh many shall be purified mm. right that's, that's priestly language and yeah. made white and tried but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand verse 11 and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken up or taken away, mm -hmm. and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, that should be one a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm just looking in here to see if I see um, Moed. It's not here. No, it's um, not that. But, yeah, it's not it's here. But the, yeah, it's a different word. But the relationship, um, you know, using the word tamid, uh, tamid yeah. um, is again referring to what's given daily, right? And we know there's a sacrifice given daily, offerings given daily, etc. So again, that yeah. relates back to the annual gathering, right? Because even on those point in times, you are giving something uh, at that time up as well, right? And it says that that would be taken away. Right, so all the works that have to do with the temple is going to be removed and taken away, right? Um, that includes the officiating of the feast days from the temple seat as well, right? Um, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, I see what you're saying. So you know, okay. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. So what I'm going to do is give you one or two minutes to close out because we do have one last guest. I do want to give him some time. We spoke for almost 40, 45 minutes. And then I'm going to move on to the next guest. Okay, to the last guest, and we're going to close out. So um, okay, we well, got a minute or two to close out your your point, um, my brother. Okay. Well, yeah. Dang. Oh, 
Oh my goodness, I ain't get to the Zarkites, man. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh no, listen, we're gonna do a part two next Friday. We're just gonna be talking about the feast days. That's it, right? So okay, whatever cool, you cool, don't cool, get cool. now, we can get then. Um, so you got a minute to close out, and then we're gonna move to the next one. Okay. Okay, cool, no doubt. Okay, um, so um, I'm gonna pass that and go to the Zarkites, right? Because like this whole idea that um, as I was speaking to some time before about the criminal community, how how they were not there, so on and so forth, based off uh some markers evidence etc right and i know for sure now they were not there right um and here's why because in my opinion my opinion for my studies right is that by the same group that we extol in regards to the market being revolved and how to fight against the greeks and hanukkah you know judah might be them right all of them they, it, it, these are the same group that read and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, these are the ones who produce um, the community rule and the um, the war scroll. A example, real quick. Okay, a example. I the list of the names in the war scroll. Um, there's a column one um, versus, I think, like one through two, um, whom they call the Sons of Darkness, um, being the um, sons of Ammon, Edom, Moab, um, uh, Philistia, um, the Katim of Assyria, and, um, and those traitors Israelites who who uh, who allowed themselves with the Katim of Assyria, meaning the Assyrian um, Empire, right? And these are the same nations, same nations that. Judah, along with the Hasidim and those other Israelites who who migrated up to the Gulf and the Hills with them to join them to come one, are found in first in the first book of Maccabees, um, chapters three, verses thirty eight through forty one. The same group. And they talk about um there's uh, security protocols that they use, like in um in first second of bees, um about the passwords they use, right? The um, which the uh, the generals are heads of, of the army that will go out before they fight, meaning Judah, in particular Judah, that he would use like uh, the Vithra God or the Heber God. These same two quote unquote passwords, as it's translated, <clears throat> that are found in the same in, in the same book of the War Scroll, right? The hymn of uh, the hymn of the return. Is also found in the war scroll is what they used right after their victory come back from the slain of the dead right and it's and it, and it tells exactly what the hymn of return is being they say this that for his mercy is good uh hold on they said that um he is good for his mercy endures forever so I, how how is this how is this lining up to the feast days I mean, no, I was, I, I, I was, I was going to pass that in regards to the Zodokites, but that's oh no, no, okay, thing, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's let's reserve that yeah. for next uh, Friday because it's getting late, and I don't want to hold up our next guest um, okay. because I could follow the stuff that you're saying. Um, maybe not the audience, but if we take some time to unpack it, just oh yeah, just write down the points that you want to make next Friday, and let's just hammer on those those three major points and have a conversation around those points, okay? Okay, yeah. Yeah. I got them all right now. Thank you for time, showing me that in, yeah, thank you for showing me that in Daniel because I, I never paid attention to that before. So I'm gonna go back and look into that about the uh Moed and Moedim that's uh mentioned in Daniel. So I'm gonna go back and look into that because I never paid attention to that before, which is crazy because I have a whole um exegetical commentary on Daniel here and I didn't even I didn't even go to chapter twelve because I'm still stuck in seven uh to nine i didn't even get to 12 yet to actually parse through it and see actually what it says so that was a great okay. some great insight there i'm gonna look into that but yeah make three points and then uh, you can come back next friday uh, i'll be going live same time 10 30 11 right and we can go from there okay brother okay no doubt no doubt no doubt all right I appreciate, appreciate your time king all right that's my good brother uh Yahoo bendora I appreciate his time. You know, sometimes 
he has a lot of information in his head. So he'd be going here, here. You think I'm bad. He's worse than me. He'd be going here, here, here. However, he does point out some gems sometimes when he talks. And I'd be like, wow, I never even paid attention to that. You know, um, and that's something that I'll definitely take into account um, because whatever conversation I had, I always learned something. OK, so I'm going to end off real quick. I'm going to let um, this elder Adum come on the stage. We'll chat for about 30 minutes or so because I don't want to prolong the time. And then again, if he wants to come back next Friday, all you got to do, Elder, I'm going to drop the link in the chat. All you got to do is click on the link, come to the backstage, and then when I give you the floor, you can feel uh, feel free to speak. So I'm going to add you right now, and uh, you have an opportunity to speak, my brother. You got it now. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks again uh, for allowing me to be on your platform. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, great. Um, well, I, I'm going to be brief. It's late. I'm just getting in. I work 16 hours a day, just like last time I was on your program. I'm not prepared for anything. I don't know when you come on. I've been trying to get with you on this. And, um, you know, I think this is a topic, you know, that's uh, very, um, needs a lot of uh, critical analysis that we don't, there's some a lot of point. I, I'm just going to be brief because I know it's late and I'm just getting in not long ago and I just tuned in. I didn't even know if you were on or not. I've been trying to uh, get back with you. So, uh, but a lot of times when I hear brothers like yourself and I've been in this community for over 50 years now and a lot of um, basically where I'm trying to go with this is um, a lot of the foundational teachings of the whole Passover is just off because I don't hear anyone talking about the memorial of Passover. Uh, can you speak for a minute to make sure I can hear you? Because for some reason... Oh, no. I, I oh, muted myself oh, I so you can talk. Oh, yeah, I don't want to... It just sound like dead air. Okay, so I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we're keeping the Passover, the Passover. Again, when I was on your program the last time, I don't know, two years ago maybe, the last Passover was in 70 AD. There has not been another Passover since 70 AD. What people are attempting to do, if anything, is keep what is called the memorial of Passover. And there is a difference between the actual Passover that's in Exodus 12 and what is considered the yearly memorial. And I don't hear many teachers speak on this. In Exodus 12, there are specific instructions for the Passover. You know, put the blood over the door, stay in your house, right? Uh, dip, the, dip it in hyssop and all of that, right? But there are specific instructions for the yearly memorial of Passover, which a lot of people try to lump all of the instructions into one cohesive in set of instructions and they're totally different. Now let me give you one of the key factors that's totally different so that I, so that you may see where I'm coming from when I say this. What was done with the blood at the Passover in Exodus 12? The blood was to be put upon the uh, two side posts of the door of their houses and above the lintel of their houses. Is that correct or not? Yep, that's what it says in Exodus 12. Okay, so now, so that is an example of the Passover. Now, when they were celebrating the yearly memorial of Passover, what instructions did the Most High give to do with the blood for the yearly memorial? I have no clue. You tell me, Elder. Okay. And the reason why is because a lot of, just like myself, we were taught wrong because we weren't taught the difference. The blood was supposed to, first of all, the people were supposed, uh, some significant things happened between Exodus 12 and what you read about in Leviticus 23. Thing number one is, uh, when they came out of Egypt, they were commanded to build the most high a tabernacle and uh, put the Levites in front of the, to, to do the service of the tabernacle. There's over like 23, 24,000 Levites who stood at the door of the tabernacle to do the service of the tabernacle. This has nothing to do with Exodus 12. This is, this is going forward. So during that period, 
in the wilderness, they were keeping the memorial of Passover for over 40 years. They were not given the same instructions for the memorial of Passover as they were given for the Passover in Egypt. And the example that I'm bringing forth is what was done with the blood. Now, I, I agree with you up to that point. Yeah. I don't really have any contention, but yeah, you yeah. keep talking about the blood. Get to, Can you get to that point? What do you mean when you say the blood? Yes, this is where a lot of people miss the point. And the reason that we miss the point, just like I did before, is because what we do is we go to Exodus 12 and then we go all the way to Leviticus 23. But to properly teach the difference between the Passover and the memorial of Passover, you can't go from Exodus 12 and jump all the way to Leviticus 23. You have to go from Exodus 12 and start at Leviticus chapter 1. And if you do that, then you will understand what takes place in Leviticus 23. Without take, with, And I'm going to read it real quickly. Without understanding Leviticus chapter 1 as pertaining to the ritual memorial yearly practice of the Passover and what was commanded by Yah himself to do with the blood, just like he commanded what was to be done with the blood in Exodus 12, let me read it. Let me read it real quick. I know it's late, and I'm just getting into it. I work 16 hours a day. So, um, okay. So the proper way, and I'm going to have to put the, uh, this phone down, okay? Uh, so I'm going to go yeah, No through. problem. Yes, sir. Because, uh, you know, just so you know, I just want to make a reference to this. Numbers chapter 9, starting at verse 1, is the second Passover that they performed after they exited out of Egypt. That means that was the following year. And there's instructions in Numbers chapter 9 going from verse 1 all the way down to verse 8. So is what you're saying in reference to that? Actually, excuse me, to verse 14. Is what you're saying in reference to that? Or are you talking about something else in a way we're misinterpreting Leviticus chapter 23 when it reckons the Passover? Exactly. See, Numbers chapter 9 is not the second Passover. That's Numbers chapter nine is an example of the very first time that they kept the very first number one memorial of Passover. So what you will see in Numbers chapter nine. Okay, is, I agree. I agree with exactly. that. Exactly. So that. Okay. So when uh, the word memorial is 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 got a lot of people confused. You can substitute the word memorial for anniversary. Like if you were married. Last year, your anniversary is a year later, right? So the very first anniversary of what happened in Exodus 12 happens in Numbers chapter 9. It's a perfect example of the very first memorial of what happened in Exodus 12. So what actually happened in Exodus 12 is the Passover. But what happens in Exodus chapter, I'm sorry, in Numbers chapter 9 is the very first time that they kept the memorial, as you were just saying. But now th there's a difference. By then, the tabernacle is reared up, and you got the Levites, and you got the, the okay, the very, the thing that most people miss is now that they had the memorial, now they're dealing with the Levites, and now they're dealing with the altar of burnt sacrifices they were not dealing with that in in egypt in exodus 12 because exodus 12 okay. was the passover so now they're giving instructions on how to keep a yearly memorial okay, and if you I, want I, the I, perfect I, example I, of how to keep the uh -huh. yearly memorial you got it's, it's very simple let's go see what they did at the very first one right so okay. you won't get a better example on how to keep the yearly memorial of passover unless you look at what they did at the very first one. And the very first one is in Numbers chapter 9. And the, and the key difference is now you got the Levites and you mm -hmm. got the altar of burnt sacrifices. You didn't okay. have that in, in Exodus 12. Yeah, because, because the Levites was not established at that time yet. They were still in captivity. Exactly. But okay. now, but now mm -hmm. they're keeping memorials. So okay. if you're saying that you're keeping memorials today, correct, then you would have to be keeping the memorial instructions the same way, correct? 
to right? a certain extent. And well, no, that... no, no, ain't no certain extent. Because <laughs> think, about, why, think about it, think about it, my right. brother. Now, okay. in Exodus 12, you couldn't mm -hmm. do it to a certain extent. You had to follow step by step instructions, or the death angel would destroy you, correct? You couldn't no. say, well, this is the way was, I'm doing was, it now. There was, right? there was no death angel after the the Passover, um, because that was the oh, plague yeah. to demonstrate oh, yeah. that that Yah was oh, supreme yeah. over the gods oh, yeah. of Egypt. No, no, and that that no. Was the I'm not saying there was a death angel. That's what okay. you're saying. What I'm no, saying I didn't say is that. I didn't the say most that time, okay, let's just read it. Let's just okay. read it let, so that we can be clear sure. on what I'm saying. Yeah. There, no, I'm not saying there was no death angel. I'm saying the most high gave specific instructions on how to I, keep I his memorial every year. Okay, and he didn't leave it up to us to make up anything. And there are there were penalties in Exodus twelve for not keeping it the way he commanded. Just like there are penalties in uh, uh, in Numbers and Leviticus on how to keep the memorial. If you uh, if uh, he's let's just read it. I'm I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. The problem so, so is, my dear brother. Real quick, so no, is numbers does numbers nine in number chapter nine. Is the temple built at this point or no? No, it didn't need no temple. The you didn't temple need was temple the temple was the tabernacle at that time. That's where the God placed his name. In the, the okay. temple came yeah. later. Correct. See, we're going, we're going for see, you can't understand all of that if you jump that far ahead. And uh, again, this where a lot of you all missed the mark. Okay. And I've been trying to point this out because we all have been taught a lot of false traditions. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between, first of all, you got to understand one thing. There's a difference between the Passover, which is in Exodus 12, there's instructions for that night, correct? Or the death angel killed him, right? That's okay. correct. So right. now, after that, a year later in Numbers 9, they're all dealing with the memorial of I Passover. I agree. I right? agree. So yes. he gave specific, not me, he gave specific mm -hmm. instructions for his memorial how it should be kept year after year after year correct okay, okay. Uh, now correct. let's go read but uh, now this is the problem many people skip over the instructions what they do is they go from exodus 12 and they jump over to leviticus 23 now if you want to properly teach people the memorial of passover instructions you can't go from Exodus 12 and go to Leviticus chapter 23. You have to go to Exodus 12 and go to Leviticus chapter 1, and then you will see what his instructions are for the memorial. So let me do that real quick. It's late. So I'm going to start at Leviticus chapter 1, which most people skip over. So by the time they get to Leviticus chapter 23, they have no idea what that's talking about. As, and remember, Focus on the blood. The blood. Just like in Exodus 12, the focus was the blood. You didn't put that blood over the door, you were cut off, wiped out by the death angel. Now let's focus on the blood for the memorial and see what's taking place now. So in Leviticus chapter 1, it says, And y'all called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the congregation, out, out, out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, if any man of you bring an offering to Yah, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, of the herd, and of the flock. Now, we're dealing with birth, burnt offerings in chapter, uh, in verse 3. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice, what kind of sacrifice is the Passover lamb? A burnt sacrifice. It's not boiled. It's not baked. It's burnt. It says, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him uh, offer. What, what a verse male. are you at, Elder? What verse? Uh, I'm in verse three, sir. Okay, go ahead. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice, now he set up the tabernacle, the Levites, and the altar of burnt sacrifice. Wait, what? What verse are you at? Three. What chapter? This one. is number Leviticus nine. One. Oh, Leviticus, you're in. Wow. Yes. But you, but you did the same thing you said we shouldn't do, which is jump over. Uh, numbers and go to Leviticus. No, you have to go to Leviticus chapter one before you go to Leviticus twenty-three. Is what I'm saying. 
Leviticus chapter one about the offerings. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. And, and I disagree with you when you said that it's a burnt offering. I disagree with that. This, uh, so the Passover yeah. lamb is not burnt? No. No. Well, what yes. Is, well, let me, let me say that. Is that burnt? What yeah, is wait, it? wait, hold on. <laughs> it, it's butchered. It is eaten and its remains are burnt. So it does not carry over until the next day. It is not burnt initially because then you can't eat it. Huh? A burnt it's offerings burnt, though, are not right? designed. It's a burnt, burnt offerings. And burnt sorry. offerings are not designed to be eaten. They're designed to be burnt. Okay, let's the see. Whole consumption of a let's thing. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let's go see. Okay. Let's go to Leviticus chapter one and let's see. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Elbro. You got it. Uh, I'm gonna go to Leviticus. I'm gonna I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start at verse three. And verse three is starting with burnt offerings. It says, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice mm -hmm. of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Correct. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. Now, where did he offer it? At, At the, the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yah. He's now, got 23. Now, now, is that person eating this burnt offering? Of course. So you're saying so the person is eating it, right? The individual yes. that's offering it is eating the burnt offering. Of course, yeah. Okay, so let's okay. Go ahead. Okay, he shall. I'm gonna start at verse three again. If the person offering, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice mm -hmm. of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He mm -hmm. shall offer it of his own voluntary will. Correct. Where? at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yah. This is Correct. one That's year after. Now, is. remember now, so you have to, like the brother was just saying before, you have to read these in context. This is this is months after coming out of Egypt, the most has command in this. They haven't, this is not a full year. This is only months after, because now they're rearing up the tabernacle. He's putting the Levites in place. He's putting the vessels in the, in the tabernacle, and now he's giving him the instructions. So okay. we ain't, they're not even a whole year out of Egypt yet. So they haven't gotten to the very first memorial of Passover yet, correct? That's correct. I just want to see right. where just somebody so, eats this offering. Okay, I want to okay see we're that. gonna see, but we, we just gotta read. That's we'll see. Sure. We'll see. But I have to lay that down to let people know this is only. A few months after they're coming out of Egypt, they have not gotten to the very first memorial of Passover yet. The very first Passover, the very first memorial of Passover is going to be in Numbers chapter 9. And they ain't gotten there yet. He's giving them this instructions first. And then they'll be in Numbers chapter 9 later, months later after this. But he's laying this down before they get to Numbers chapter nine, correct? We on the same page? I I, I don't I can't say that for certainty. Oh, but I was saying, okay. No, 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 no. Okay, well, let's let the reading. No, 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 no. I'm only I'm only saying let's that. Let's let That's the reading say that for certain. Okay, I got so you. So let I'm me not, just finish I'm, reading. So we'll see. We'll keep it in context. Okay. Ask me a question. All right, go ahead. You got it. Yes, sir. I just want to. So we'll keep it in context. So I, I had to lay that down because this is several months after they come out out of Egypt. And they have not yet gotten to the very first memorial of Passover. And we're going to see that very clearly. Um, verse 3. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. There's a certain place. At the door of the tabernacle of the congregations. He's got 23, 24,000 Levites at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to receive those offerings. Verse four, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. So this is the worshiper bringing the, the offering of, a, of, a, of the herd. He's going to put his hand upon the head of that burnt offering. And that person who brought it, shall it, it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. Verse five, and that person who brought that herd offering, that the person who brought that herd offering shall kill the bullock before Yah. Now, when it says before Yah, that's meaning at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's the only time it's accepted before Yah. We're going to see that as we read. When he says before Yah, that didn't mean in your house. That meant 
at his at the door of his house in front of his 23 are you saying this are you saying this has to do with passover that's what you're telling oh, us oh yes oh yeah okay. we're, we're, right. we're getting okay, there we're getting there we're getting there sir yes sir all of this and this is why a lot of people are confused because they don't equate none of this with Passover. They jump from Exodus 12 and go to 23. They skip all over this like this has nothing to do with the memorial of Passover. And that's why there's so much confusion. Uh, verse 5. Or was, so, so a bull was offered at Passover as well? I didn't say that. I no, didn't but say that's, that. the, that's what the text that's, you're reading hold on, says. Hold on a second, brother. I okay. understand your gotcha. question. I really do. Just let me continue reading, and I'm going to sum this up and show you where I'm going, okay? And then I would love to answer all of those questions, but just follow along with me for a minute, okay? And I understand your questions, because I had the same ones. Verse 5, and he shall, now we're talking about the herd, remember? This is an offering of the herd in verse 3, right? And he shall kill the bullock before, now I'm in verse 5, and he shall kill the bullock, that's from the herd. Before Yah at the and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood. Look, check up. Okay, pay attention to the blood offerings. Okay, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you couldn't take the blood and put it over the door of your house and all that kind of mess no more because now they had to take the blood. Uh, the, the person would kill that bullock, the priest would catch that blood, and the priest would sprinkle the blood upon the four horns of Yahweh's burnt offering. That's with the herd, okay? Now, verse 6, And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put the fire upon the altar and lay the wood upon and lay the wood in order upon the fire and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts and the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar now what altar are we talking about we're talking about the altar that is in the tabernacle the burnt altar the altar of burnt sacrifices that's the altar now, in verse nine, but his inward, but his inwards and his legs shall he wash with water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Yah. Now, when you read that, you you will find the very same uh, renderings in Leviticus twenty three a sweet savor unto Yah. So when you get into Leviticus 23, you'll understand what it means when it says a sweet savor unto Yah. The only sweet savor unto Yah was when the the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, burnt sacrifice was placed upon his altar. That is the sweet savor unto Yah in Leviticus 23. Now, we think this don't have nothing to do with Passover. Let's see. Verse 10. And if his offering be of the flocks, now, is a sheep of the flocks? Yes, brother, sheep okay. and goat. Thank you. Namely, of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. Isn't that the exact same thing has to be done with the Passover lamb? Yes, but I don't. This is I still don't see the connection here. You will in a minute. You will in a minute. Okay. But I'm asking you these questions for a minute. I'm I'm really not trying to put anybody on the spot. I'm just trying to teach what I consider the proper way to teach the memorial of Passover and how the Most High set it up. So the actual Passover was in Egypt. It was in Egypt, Exodus chapter twelve. And now he's giving them the instructions on how to keep the memorial of Passover year after year after year. So now when they're when you're in Numbers chapter nine, okay, so in in in, in Leviticus chapter one, verse 10, he's talking about burnt offerings of the flocks. He's given a, a specific commandment. 
if you, I'm going to read it one more time. Verse 10. And if his offering be of the flock. Now, you want to give an offering up to the Most High and it's of the flock. Namely, of the sheep or of a goat. Now, you want to give that offering. It's not the Passover lamb of the flock, a sheep or a goat. Yes or no? Very simple. Yes or no? Okay. The Passover lamb is an offering to Yah of the, of the flock. It's a sheep or a goat, right? For a burnt sacrifice. It's a burnt sacrifice, correct? It's not a lie. You can't offer it to them live. You can't offer them to them boiled. You can't offer them to them baked. It's got to be burnt. He shall bring it a male without blemish. Isn't that the same for the Passover lamb? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. Verse 11. And, and now the person that brought it, he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before Yah and the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about, round about upon the altar. There's now in Exodus 12, they were told to take that blood and put it on the two side posts of the, of the door of their houses and above the lintel. He's not telling them to do that no more. He's commanding them, now you must bring the offering slayed before his priest. He's got 23, 24,000 priests standing at the door of his tabernacle to receive those offerings. You kill it before his priest. They're going to catch the blood, and then they're going to put that blood, sprinkle it on the four horns of his altar. He ain't telling them to put it in no, on no houses no more, right? Yes, but brother. And, and, and one more thing, one more thing. The reason why I know that they were not putting it on the side posts of their houses and upon the door posts of their houses. Now, remember, they're keeping the yearly memorial of Passover in the wilderness, right? Were they not? Yes or no? Yes. So he was not telling them to put no blood on the two side posts of your houses and above the lintel of your houses like he did in Egypt, the number one reason why anybody would know that now is because now they're dwelling in tents. They're not living in no houses. So he would not tell them to do that now, and they're keeping the yearly memorial, so there's no way he's going to tell them, okay, take the blood and put it on the side, two side posts of your houses and put it above, above the lintel of your houses like I told you in Egypt, even though you don't have no house and you're dwelling in a tent. That don't make any sense. So he's not telling them to do the same thing with the blood. Something different is commanded to be done with the blood of the sacrifices for the yearly memorials now. And that blood was to be brought before his priest and the priest would catch that blood and sprinkle it upon the four horns of Yahweh's altar. This is in Le Leviticus chapter one. So by the time you get to Leviticus 23, you think he changed that? When you read, the, oh. when you go into the mm -hmm. holy days of Leviticus 23 and you start reading about Passover, do you think he changed it from what he just said in Leviticus one to something else? Of course not. No, but Leviticus 1 is unrelated to the Passover. Okay, so now you show us where okay. there's, he said, do something different okay. with the blood of the Passover lamb. Show us where he said do something different with it. All right, so nowhere in Leviticus chapter 1 is a mention of Pesach. Can you tell us what verse uh, Pesach is mentioned in Leviticus chapter 1? Uh, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 10 is talking about the Pesach. It's talk Pesach, it? mean, so Pesach means sacrifice lamb. No, it means Le Passover, right? That okay, what are you sacrificing for oh, Pesach? Oh. A lamb, correct? A uh, lamb or a goat. But what I'm saying right, is... Right, you're sacrificing 10, a lamb Passover. or a goat, right? Okay, yeah. so that's a Pesach, right. correct? 
Um, no, because the oh. purpose of doing it. Yeah. So one thing you got to look at, right? The the burnt offerings is what you get in Leviticus chapter one is referring to burnt offerings. Right. Correct. And yes. no way. Wait, hold on. No way in here. Does it say that anybody's eating these burnt offerings? Oh, you, Where, that's because you didn't actually read. actually actually show me that. Well, just tell me what verse is that? What verse is okay, that? Well, Elder? Well, let's keep reading. Let's keep. No, reading. no, no, no. Elder, wait, we, we're limited on time. I just would like for you to be concise and just point to the scripture just so we can read it for the sake of time, right? What verse tells us we're to eat this, any part of this burnt offering? The person okay. has given it to the priest. Where, what, what verse is that at? Because I'm looking at it. I, I okay. honestly do not see that. That verse is in Leviticus 23. So by the time you get to Leviticus 23, you will be, understand what is the, okay, okay, you're, what you're doing Wait, is... Wait, so we going to read from okay. Leviticus 1 to Leviticus okay. 23? No, 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 That's no, 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 Okay, let, let, let's just keep this in context, as, 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 as I was trying to do. I understand what you're trying to say. So what you're dealing with here is an instruction from the Most High for a burnt offering. Let's start there before we get to the eating part. The, the instructions are for burnt offerings, correct? Okay, I burnt agree. Burnt offerings for lamb and goat from the, the flock. I, I agree. Male, a bull, without blemish, lamb right? and goat let's, and wait, bird. Let's deal no, with wait, all that. Let's wait, deal with all to, of that. Wait, wait, Elder, it's referring to bulls, lambs, and No, 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 I'm not talking about bird. bulls. I'm not no, talking about that's bulls. That's the context of the chapter. Not Passover. I'm talking about Passover. We're this talking about the Passover. We're talking about We're talking about a lamb or sheep, or goat, without blemish of the first year, that is a burnt offering. That's what we're talking about here in Leviticus chapter 1. I agree. So, right? Okay. So now, that, okay. So, okay. I see what you're trying to do. Yeah. But, I'm just saying, but, but okay, anything. okay. But let's, let's come to an agreement on, number one, the Passover lamb fits all of the criteria right here in verse 10. Is that no, correct? No, because the Passover lamb is eaten first. Okay. Uh, according to, wait, wait, wait. Uh, according to yes, Exodus 12. Yes. And, wait, wait. And it's yes. not offered to the priest. Huh? Are you going to show me? It's not offered the to the priest. Wait, wait, wait. Are you going to show me in Leviticus 23, because it's not here in Leviticus 1 about the Passover lamb, specifically the Passover lamb that we are to butcher on the 14th day between the evenings and eat the evening of the 15th during unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Are you telling me that that lamb is offered first to the priest and then the priest gives it back and then we eat it and then we give it back to the priest to remain so he can burn it? Is that what you're saying, Elder? That is not what I'm saying. Leviticus chapter one is saying that. And if you would just simply But they're not continue, eating it. They're not eating it. Okay. In chapter you're focused one. on the eating, which is what you're what you're focused on the eating, and what I'm and this is the reason why you're missing the whole mark because of okay. the eating part. But what but that's what you're supposed to do on Passover, right? Is eat the lamb, correct? And and the lamb is a burnt offering of the sheep and of the goats, correct? <laughs> not for Passover. What does That's this say? Not for you. What, okay, okay. So th then you show us where he okay. says, "Do the burnt offerings of the lambs and the goats for Passover that you don't I, have to take this." But practice. I never, brother. You okay, look. Let me do this. Let me do this. I got you. So let me do this because I'll let you speak. Now, All right. I'm gonna pause you for a second just so I can talk. Okay, and then I'm gonna give it back to you to close out, and then I'm gonna close out. Is that okay? All right. I appreciate that. And again, Anytime. I appreciate that. It's a very complicated topic. And the reason that you're asking what you're asking is because you skipped over Leviticus chapter one and you think it has nothing to do with Passover. But there's no way that the Most High is going to give instructions on what to do with burnt offerings and then say, well, when it comes to Passover, do something else with a burnt offering. Now, you read that to us. That's what you read okay. to us. So, so, okay. okay. So, all right, gotcha. All right. And, All right. and then again, if you if you'd like Elder, you can definitely come back next Friday. I'll be going live around 10 45, 11 o'clock for another uh, two hours or so. Thank you. And I get off work around that time. But thank oh, you, you do? What time you get off? Man, I man, like the last time I was on your show, man. My you know, I'm in the movie business too, man. We work 60. I work like two full I'm 63 years old and I'm still working wow. two full-time jobs. So 
Wow. I start, my day starts around 5 a.m. and I get in, you know, 10, 30, 11. So I was sort of. So why are you not of, sleeping right now? I, I don't even know how sometimes, brother. <laughs> you need to go to bed. Elder. I don't know how you do it. That's I, don't need, crazy. I was so sleepy on your first show, man. It was just all I could do was just hang on and talk, to be honest. I got man. you. I got you. But, but uh, listen, I, your health, your health become, comes before yeah. this. Yeah, and bro. you know, uh, if there's a um, if there's a better time, so like for example, I'm going out of town next week, right? Um, I have a job that I have to do, a project I'm working on, IT project. I'm going out of town next week, right? So during that time period, my family will not be with me, so it'll be more convenient for me to go live sooner on that Tuesday. So I'll be out Tuesday and Wednesday. So on that Tuesday, um, I'm doing my class from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then after that class, I'm going to go live right early so I can get it out the way. I don't know if that's convenient for you um, in the early <sighs> evening, but I don't, again, I don't know what your, what your schedule being, like you said, 60 plus hours. I have no clue what your availability is. No, I worked 78 hours this week. 78? Yes, sir. In one week? That's regular for me. Are you resting on the Shabbat? Uh, most of the time, yes. Uh, oh, okay. cause that's, yeah, that's between Monday and Friday. Yeah, my day starts mostly like 4 a.m., a lot of time 5 a.m., and I'm getting in maybe 10, 30, 11, 12. I'm doing 16, 17 hours a day. I've been doing that for years. You, have, you don't even have no time to even be on here. You should be looking at this on the replay. Um, <laughs> but, but it's all good. So wait, so let me, let me address what you said real quick. And then um, I'm going to let you close out and then I'm going to close out. OK, so I'm just going to make my point very, very succinct. Right. I'm going to I'm going to mute you for a second. I'm going to go to do a few passages and then I'm going to give it back to you. OK. Yes, sir. OK. All right. So first, if we're going to start off with Passover. Right. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12 and let's see what the instruction is in regards to uh, what to do with the lamb. Right. So Exodus chapter 12. Right. And again, this this reference to a lamb without blemish, a year old, right, or goats as well, is what the elder was referring to in regards to Leviticus chapter one. I have no problem with that. There's a there's a whole nother conversation as to why the lamb has to be without blemish, and it has nothing to do with Passover because these unblemished lambs were being offered and given before the Exodus account, before Moses was even alive. But that's another conversation, right? Um, it says, you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight or be between the evenings, right? Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So I agree with him. You don't, you're not putting blood on the lintel of your doorpost because like he said, when, they, when the successive Passovers for those 40 years in the wilderness, they don't have stationary homes to even do that. They're intense. I completely agree with that. However, there is food reference here. You have to eat it. It says nothing here about you giving this lamb to a priest to do anything. It says that you eat it. And look at verse 8. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread this is why when you eat the passover it's in the evening that's transitioning to the 15th day of unleavened bread because that same day from evening to evening after they ate midnight hit the death angel killed off the firstborn of, of egypt they woke up in the morning found out that all the dead was there in egypt and they told the israelites you better get the heck up out of here they had no time to bake the bread they had to leave. That's why it was unleavened, right? And bitter herbs they shall eat. It says, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head and its legs and its inner parts. So they have to roast the flesh before they eat it. They cannot eat it raw or boiled. It has to be cooked. And watch this, verse 10. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is not a burnt offering. Because according to Leviticus chapter 1, you're not eating anything. You're giving the whole animal, presenting it before the tent of meeting, butchering it there. And now the priest does something with the blood. 
You don't eat any of it. Nothing in Leviticus chapter 1 says anything about eating anything. Therefore, it cannot be the same ordinance as Passover in Exodus chapter 12. That's what I just wanted to say. And it says, in this matter, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals in your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, right? For I will pass through the land. This is what the Passover is about. Passing through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yah. The blood shall be a sign for you and on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike Egypt. This is Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. And when we go into here to see what this is talking about, it says this word here, upasah t. This word Pesach is in, I will pass. It has to do with skipping over or passing over. That's what Pesach is about. That is what is represented by. Now, going back to what you mentioned, I think you mentioned a very good point, which is the Zikron. We see that in verse 14. This day shall be a memorial day. Watch this. And you shall keep it as a feast to Lord throughout your generations as a statute until 70 AD. As a statute to 135 AD, as a statute to 332 BC, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is this is what it says. I mean, this is this has nothing to do with presenting lamb or goat unblemished from your flock, slaying it at the tent of meeting, giving it to the priest who takes the blood and sprinkles the blood. This is nothing that has nothing to do with what's going on in Exodus 12. Now, let's go see after these commandments are given, right? In the word, they had a seek wrong for the memorial. Let's go to Numbers chapter 9 and see what they did they do. Did they give a whole animal, whole, butcher it at the tent of meeting, and then give it to the priest to consume as a burnt offering? Did they let's see if they did that? This is the second Passover after that previous one in Exodus 12. And the Lord said to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time according to all its statutes and all its rules. You shall keep it. So here, what is it talking about all its statutes and all its rules? This is something assumed based on the first Passover in which instructions were given. So it says here in verse four, so Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. We're gonna, we're gonna keep reading. Let's keep reading and see something very interesting. And they kept the Passover in the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all the Lord commanded Moses, so the people of Israel did. Well, those commands are not explicit here. We only have it in Exodus 12. So that's what they was doing as a memorial. Then it says, and there were certain men. Now, now at this point, going to verse six, I see nothing about giving that flock from that, excuse me, that lamb or goat from your flock to the priest. It don't say give it to the priest as a burnt offering. It's not here. And it says, and there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body so that they could keep, not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, we are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at his appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, wait that I may hear that the, what the Lord will command concerning you. So now the Most High amended his ordinance for Passover to accommodate his people. That's another, that's a whole message right there, but I'm not even going to preach that right now. And verse nine, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, if any one of you or your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the pass. Wait, you on a long journey? How in the world are you going to keep the Passover if you're on a long journey? Well, then he says, I'm gonna give you a combination. In the second month on the 14th day at twilight, they shall keep it, they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning. Again, eating is happening. Leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones according to all the statute for the Passover. They shall keep it. But if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person should be what? Cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time 
that man shall bear his sin. Now we have something very interesting here. The Lord's offering. Well, what is the Lord's offering? That's very interesting. Let me get verse 14. And if a stranger should join among you and would keep the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of Passover and according to its rule, so shall he do. You shall have one statue, both for the sojourner and the native. This goes back to Exodus chapter 12. You don't have anything explicit here about how to deal with that stranger, but you do in Exodus 12, which again gives you the memorial for the Passover to be kept after the Passover. Now, I agree with all of that. Last verse I want to get to is Leviticus chapter 23, right? And well, actually, Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16, real quick. Leviticus chapter 23, I'm going to jump down, right, 23, and I'm going to go to where it says the Passover. It says, again, we want to see if they are giving this to the priests, right? These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy congregation, which you shall proclaim at the time appointing for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordering work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord. For what? The feast of unleavened bread. For seven days. It's not talking about Passover. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And that's it. There's nothing about bringing a lamb to the priest for a burnt offering. Because guess what? After you slaughter the lamb and roast it by fire, you eat it and whatever remains, you burn it so it does not carry over until the next day. There's nothing about giving it to the priest. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and read what it says about the Passover. Deuteronomy chapter 16, jumping at verse 1. Observe the month of Aviv and keep the Passover to the Most High your power. For in the month of Aviv, the Most High your power brought you out of Egypt by night. Here is the memorial now because they, they're going back to a first precedence that was established and you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. Now we have a transition coming from Exodus to Numbers to Leviticus. Now we're going to Deuteronomy where we see something is changing. Now, again, I'm not going to get into all the technicalities of this. I had a whole debate like four years ago with the brother explaining to him about this Deuteronical author who is now taking everything that was meant to be a familial practice and nationalizing it to the place where he chose to dwell or place his name. Another conversation, but let's keep going. You shall eat. And again, I don't see, I don't see no, no uh priests. So they say you should do Passover in that place where he placed his name, which is Jerusalem, right? But there's no priest here at all. Now it transitions from this and goes right into unleavened bread. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you come out of the land of Egypt. Nothing about a priesthood involved in here at all. There's no kohanim involved with this Passover at all. Matter of fact, we don't even really see none here in regards to um, unleavened bread. Let's keep going. We're going to jump down. You, should, may, you may not offer the Passover, the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God has given you, but at the place that the Lord your God will, uh, will choose to make his name dwell in it, there you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt to the priests. No, 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 no. Don't say nothing about the priests there. But there is a transition on where exactly do you keep the Passover. We see that stark difference. However, the preponderance of the evidence is on Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers over what we get in Deuteronomy 16. Meaning that we have three witnesses that say that this is to be done locally. Nothing about the place where the Lord chooses to place his name. We only find that in Deuteronomy. That is an isolate ordinance. And there's a particular way in which you handle isolate ordinances, all right? Then it goes to say in verse seven, and you shall cook it and eat it. Again, I keep seeing cooking and eating it. I keep saying you got to eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning, you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days, you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, there should be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work in it. Now, lastly, this is where he ended up at Leviticus chapter one. Let's jump specifically to verse 10, because that's what he's honing in on. If his gift, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, a gift? Wait, wait, let's slow down real quick because we got to take an account to all the textual that it exists. Weim mean chason, right? And if of the flocks, his offering, which is kar rebano, if his offering of the sheep 
or of the goats as a burnt sacrifice, le ola, right? A male without blemish, he shall bring, if that's going to be his offering. Now you'll see translations have that word gift there. That's very important because they're showing a distinguishing marker between this and anything else in regards to an offering. Because when we keep reading Leviticus, it's going to talk about other types of offerings. This offering has nothing to do with Passover. The word Pesach is nowhere in here in any way, shape, or form. It's not conjugated in any way. There's no construct form, no absolute form. It's nowhere in verses 10 to 13. Because what I'm trying to tell the elder is that this is not just limited to goats and sheep. You can also offer a bull. You can also offer birds. You can't do that for Passover. But I can definitely give a burnt offering of birds and a burnt offering of a goat, of a sheep, and of bulls. How do you account for that when that has nothing to do with Passover? Passover, you cannot give those items for Passover. So no, Passover is not a burnt offering because never do we see anywhere in any of the passages that I read, Exodus 12, Numbers chapter 9, Leviticus chapter 23, and Deuteronomy chapter 16, does it say that any of this has to be done with a priest officiating it? And you have to eat it before you burn it. We don't see that anywhere here in Leviticus chapter 1. So my point simply is that Leviticus chapter 1 is talking about burnt offerings in general. Burnt offerings is always voluntary. Always voluntary. And that's what it's talking about. That means you have a set amount that's required. And when you want to give extra, you give it as a burnt offering. You know why it's called a burnt offering? Because you get none of it. It's wholly consumed and dedicated and devoted to Yah only. You cannot get any part of a burnt offering, but yet Passover, you can eat from some of it. And then you can burn it afterwards. They're not the same thing. They're two unrelated incidences referring to two different ordinances, right? So I understand the principles you're pulling out of Leviticus and you're looking at similarities like, hey, isn't this a lamb or a goat that you use on Passover? Yeah. Isn't it unblemished? Yeah. Doesn't it have to be slaughtered? Of course. However, the next thing is for the burnt offering, you can't eat it. It has to be given to the priest. But with the Passover, you can eat it, roasted by fire, no bones broken, and then you have to burn it afterwards. And the text says, Keep this as a memorial, Zikron, Olam, forever statute, forever. Now, did conditions change? We just see that in Deuteronomy chapter 16. Now we see an adjustment where it has to be done in the place where he placed his name. So we see adjustments. So do, are we saying that if we don't follow it according to Numbers chapter 9, we're incorrect? But what about if, if I decide to keep it according to Deuteronomy chapter 16 in the land, but yet in Numbers chapter 9, it says nothing about keeping it in the land, a place where he placed his name. Exodus 12, it says nothing about keeping it in the land where he placed his name. And Leviticus uh, 23 says nothing about keeping it in the land where he places his name. So which one do we do? Which one is right? Which one is correct? Well, if I'm going to go to two or three witnesses to establish a word, I would go with Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Deuteronomy is specific because this ordinance was adjusted post-exile. And we see that that started with Hezekiah, who sent for the couriers after the northern tribes was taken out the land by the Assyrians. He was trying to do a what we call a, a ecumenical Passover, where he wanted all the tribes in the north. Remember, the Assyrians came in. They took some of Israel out. But guess what? You still have Zebulon is still in the land. You still have Manasseh still in the land. Well, how is these northern tribes still in the land if the Assyrians took them all out? Because the Assyrians only take the nobility, royal court, and the upper middle class, and they situate them along the river so they can work it as we see in Ezekiel chapter 1. This is what they do. And guess what? We have Assyrian records and Babylonian records that say that's what they do when they conquered peoples. But yet he wanted to bring the remnant of the north to the south because remember, a divide was created by Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So he said, no, I want everybody to come to the south and keep this Passover. So now that particular ordinance of this ecumenical Passover that occurred after Solomon, because Solomon was keeping, he kept all the nations together. They all had to come to the land. Now what is happening is after Hezekiah makes that reform, other successive kings who are wicked come after him. But finally, 
when they go into captivity, the question is, did they still keep Passover? Because you got to ask that question. If if they're still keeping Passover outside of the land, then somebody didn't get the memo. When we go to the Pesach letter amongst the Elephantine Papri, you have northern tribes, Israelites that are on the island of Elephantine, writing a letter to the Israelites, the Judeans that's in the province of Israel, or at that time it was going to be the province of the Persians, and saying, hey, we just want to confirm for you that we have the ordinance for Passover correct. They say nothing about taking Aaliyah to the land in that letter. Nothing about, oh, we're supposed to go to uh, the place where he places his name to keep the pat. That language does not exist there amongst these individuals. They had everything else right, but apparently they got that part wrong. Or could the book of Deuteronomy have been written in the post-exilic period where now the priests are trying to restructure everything coming back from exile we see the same priestly language in uh nehemiah and ezra the same priestly language and the same words idiomatic expression etc we also see it in deuteronomy that is a marker a linguistic marker to let us know that this has been edited and or redacted and or interpolated to adjust for the coming back out of exile during Persian captivity. Now, that is a whole nother conversation altogether. But what I'm trying to simply say is that it's apparent that Passover was kept outside the land with no instructions to make an Leah to come back to the place where he places his name. We have three passages of scripture in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers that says nothing about us coming to the land or the place where he places his name to keep the Passover. And even in Deuteronomy, where it says the place where he places his name makes no mention of us giving our Zabach, the sacrifice of the lamb, to the priest to officiate anything. And with that, I yield. I'm going to give you two minutes to respond, Elder, to close out, and then I'm going to close out. And if you want to continue this conversation, again, I'll be available next Friday. If you're available, you're more than welcome. Or the next time I'm live, you're more than welcome to come in and speak. But I'm only going to be talking about the Passover between now until after the Passover is over, which is um, after April 8th. So you got the floor, my brother. If you're still awake, because I know you're probably really tired. Uh, you're muted. You're muted, Elder. Let me. I mean, all right, go I ahead. Appreciate you. you. Got I appreciate yeah. any time you give me on your platform. I really do. Number one, you contradicted yourself so many times. I lost track. Okay. Now let's let me, let's go back. You well, you're giving me two minutes, so I'm gonna give you the condensed version of your contradictions. Okay. You say it was Hezekiah that that started all of the Israelites. I guess you're. Your theory is that it's King Hezekiah that started all of the Israelites keeping the Passover in one place. Is that correct? No, I said that he was trying to restore it as a national holiday mm -hmm. because after the separation between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the north was not going south to keep Passover. Right. So he was so I trying said to. He, I said he enacted a reform that uh -huh. nationalized. The practice, and then we see that right, right. restored okay. so, after the Persian captivity. Correct. So, so my point is, Passover. What he was trying to restore was the fact that the memorial, because no, again, nobody's keeping the Passover anymore. People are claiming to keep the memorial of Passover, and most people don't know the difference. That's the that's a sad thing right there. But number one is. What he was trying to do was restore that everyone had to keep it in one place, correct? Say one more time. What Hezekiah was trying to do was unite everybody into keeping it the Passover in one place. In Jerusalem, correct. Right. Now, so that was the original intent. I mean, when the very first Passover was kept in one place, correct? They were all in one place keeping the first Passover, right? In Egypt, right? So they were all in one place in Egypt, keeps and Passover. In other words, now we're going to follow your, like I said, you contradicted yourself so many times. If the model is Exodus 12, then the model is everyone is keeping in one place. They were keeping it all in one place in Egypt, correct? Everybody was in Egypt. It wasn't no 
people keeping it in Egypt, and then some people was keeping it in the wilderness, and some people was keeping it in Jerusalem, and some people keeping it in Chicago, and all over the planet. They were all in one place at the very first Passover. Everyone was in Egypt, correct? Right? So the very next year, they were all in one place in that wilderness, correct? All right. So there is no, if, if your model is Exodus 12, then there is no such thing as you keeping it in here, you keeping it where you at, and then someone keeping it on the other continent and someone keeping it over there and over there and over there in another state and all that because in exodus 12 they are all in one place correct egypt right 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 they're all in one place so the the very first passover everybody all 12 tribes the strangers and everybody keeping the very first passover is in one place there is no all over the world passover in Exodus 12, correct? That's correct. Right. That's there is correct. no keeping Passover all over the world in the wilderness, correct? There's all they're all no, in the wilderness. They, they're all gathered. This is before the diaspora. But, so yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, I'm talking about the the very first Passover. I agree. I agree. And, and in the wilderness, they're all in one place. I agree. When you correct. go into the New Testament, all the way to the New Testament, they're all in one place. Even Yahshua's parents. Their custom was they ain't from Jerusalem. They were from Nazareth or Galilee. They traveled every year to one place, Jerusalem, to keep the Passover, right? I agree. That's why I okay. said it's a post so, so that whole um, custom of Passover from the its very inception is that everybody be in one place and not all over the world. Now, let me show you another that's contradiction. Ideally, correct. Now, another contradiction. You're stating that your model is Exodus 12. I, I Exodus, mentioned Exodus 12, right? Numbers uh, chapter well, 9, and Exodus, Leviticus chapter 23. Yeah. Oh, I can, I'm going to break down these one. Exodus 12, your model of keeping the Passover, they're all in their houses. Yet, when you put out your flyers every year, you command every people to come. You, com, you invite everyone to come out of their house travel from city to city, from state to state to come to one place. So that's some made up stuff right there too, because nobody did that in Exodus 12. Say, hey, hey, you over there because in the Galilee, not in the diaspora. But, but I'm, not just, in the I'm just giving an example time. now. I yeah, I agree with you. But okay, there wasn't you muted, me, but you muted me when you were when you were speaking. So I'm just trying to re give you a rebuttal uninterrupted because I wasn't allowed to, you know, uh, hone in on your um exhortation but i'm just i'm just throwing out some things when you put out your flyer every year you invite people to come out of their houses not like they did in exodus 12 that you referred to and come travel from whatever state you're in whatever country you're in and come to your place that is not what they did in exodus 12 that's not what they did in the wilderness and that's not what they did during the time of the prophets or the New Testament, or even the time if you go into 70 AD at the temple. They all came to one place to keep that one event at that one place. They didn't stay in their house. So what, what is it? Is it stay in your house like Exodus 12 or come out of your house and get on a plane and travel? Which is it? So or is it both? Or do we just make it up? No, we're not making nothing up. Okay. Because so, when they so what I'm asking is which is it? Is it stay in your house or is it twelve? You can do either or. Where does that say that? Where we get Exodus chapter twelve, Numbers chapter nine, Leviticus chapter twenty three, with no references to do it in the no. land. No, and no. hold on, and Deuteronomy, no. you do get a reference no. to travel. No. The word pilgrimage, Hagag, is there. Well, you no. have to actually travel. Yeah. What you mean? Yeah. I'm well, telling you both. The reason I'm saying no is this. In Exodus 12, like I just mentioned earlier, they're all in one place. They're all in Egypt. In, the, in, in Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, they're all in one place, the wilderness. Correct? Yes, the wilderness. Right. I so, agree. There is no, you keep it over there in that country, 
I keep it in this country and because you they were not scattered country. at that time. Okay, but you keep saying you your mom, but but see, this is why I say about the contradictions, dear brother. You say the model is Exodus 12, but then at the same flavor, you say the model is not Exodus 12. So because because in Exodus 12, no one is traveling to keep Passover. When you read Leviticus, now if you're gonna read Leviticus, They're you all gotta together. Stick, even but you you can't read us Numbers chapter nine and say this is the example and then do something totally different because in Numbers chapter nine well, everybody's in one place right now in the wilderness. So I have to do something different. See, I didn't interrupt you though, but I'm just trying to okay. Go ahead, go ahead. It, you cannot say keep it according to Exodus twelve like you were just saying, but then tell the people to do something different now because what you, you're giving mixed messages. Exodus twelve, everyone's in their house. Number one, their house. Not in no building that they travel to, like you're saying. You okay? And then when you go to Numbers, they're living in tents. They're all in one place. That place was the wilderness of Sinai, wherever they travel. But they're all together. There's, it, there's not an example of them keeping some of them in the wilderness, and then some of them in Jerusalem, and then some of them in Chicago, and all that. Like you're teaching now. That's why I say you're contradicting yourself. If you slow down, you'll see. Now, and you also, a very important thing that you're also contradicting yourself on as well. And I know a lot of people like to dismiss this when it comes to this topic, and I'm going to hold you to it out of love now. It's, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, bring nobody down to nothing, but what are you doing with the blood of this Passover sacrifice? Because in Exodus 12, it's very expensive. Explicit on what to say, what to do with the blood in Exodus 12. In Leviticus, it's very explicit what to do with the blood in Leviticus. It didn't say flush it down the toilet. It didn't say get a water hose and wash it down the drain. It didn't say put it in the garbage bag. What are the instructions to do with the blood? Because the blood is holy for Passover, whether, whether it be the memorial. This is why if you don't read Leviticus chapter 1 in this context, you will do whatever you want with the blood of that sacrifice. But the most high, the blood of a sacrifice to Yah is holy, just like it was in Exodus 12. And he did not leave it up to you or me to do whatever we want with that blood. Everyone runs from that topic. What do you do with the blood of your Passover sacrifice, according to Scripture? When you roast the lamb, there's no blood left. No, before, uh oh, ho, ho, whoa. So you don't do anything with that blood before you roast it? Okay, so for the memorial, no, <laughs> because we don't oh, see that oh, in Numbers 9. Oh. Wait, we don't see that in Leviticus 23. We don't see that in Deuteronomy 6, 6, chapter 16 about anything about doing something with blood. But Not why for do the you memorial. Ask, see, now you run into Leviticus. What do you see, mean? It, what, what you, okay. You either go see Leviticus is the memorial, Exodus is the actual. That's what, see when you don't make a difference between that, that's where you get the confusion. I know the difference. Exodus 12 is the actual Passover with instructions on what to do with the blood. And so you jump back and forth. See, I'm 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 I got two of these, two ears, two eyes for I keep my mouth shut. I'm listening very closely to what you say. You run back to Exodus when it suits your fancy. Now, I'm, I'm just saying, no, not con no condemnation, but I'm, I'm listening very attentively. In Exodus 12, if you're going to refer to Exodus 12 as your practice, in Exodus 12, the instructions to do with that blood was to put it over the uh, two side posts of the door and above the lintel of the houses. Now, again, when you read the instructions in Leviticus with burnt sacrifices, he gave instructions on what they were to do with sacrificial blood. With Passover, is a sacrifice, whether you want to admit it or not. The whole, the rap, the, the word oh, Passover I, I itself agree. actually means sacrifice, I, I, right? I agree so that it's a there, sacrifice. He has instructions on what to do with blood of a sacrifice. And during the sacrificial times, that blood was given to the priest, and they sprinkled it on the four horns of his altar. Now, I'm asking you, what do you do with the blood of your Passover sacrifice according to scripture? Since it's not the Passover, as you mentioned, that's yeah. being performed, we are obviously not taking the blood 
and we're not putting it on the doorpost. Okay. When you zabak or slaughter the lamb and then you roast it by fire, the fire that you're roasting by will lick up all of the blood. You just, I mean, do you do you ever eat food well done? I don't know if you've ever done that before. But typically, if you if you roast something by fire, the the blood is burnt and it evaporates and it's no longer there in the meal that you are eating. So we don't see anything about anything handling with the blood in regards to Numbers chapter 9. No handling of the blood in Leviticus chapter 23. No handling of the blood in Deuteronomy chapter 16. It makes no mention. So you about kill doing the lamb something. alive? You know what? You, is, he's, he's alive when you roast it? Of course not. He's dead. How do you kill it? You have to slaughter it. The text is not explicit on how to kill it. Well, okay. When you slaughter it, doesn't that shed blood? Wait, wait a minute. Hold up now. I'm, I, hey, look now. How do you? Okay. I know you talk fast. I'm slowing you down a little bit. If you kill that lamb, you shedding his blood, bro. Okay. Unless you strangle it, my brother. You, I mean, okay. come on now. You okay? We are talking about the blood here. The blood is holy. Even in the New Testament, you're talking about the Christ's blood and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the blood of that Passover lamb. You cannot sit up and tell an intelligent person like me that you slaughter a lamb and it and without shedding his blood, you just put it I on never, the grill I, with I, his I blood. Never, in I never, it. I never you said that. You can't tell nobody that I'm intelligent. I'm not, I'm not brother. saying that. I'm so, not so saying what that. What are you saying? I'm saying that the text does not tell us in the memorial phase that we are to do anything with the blood of the lamb for Passover. Okay, now I have know a, that, you, wait, okay. if you have a text I, I, that shows us what we have I'm to do with the blood does. of the lamb after the first Passover. But I'm telling you it does in Leviticus chapter one. Now I'm still asking you, what do you do with the blood of the Passover sacrificing lamb? You mean to tell me you take a live lamb and throw it on a fire and roast it to I death and then that eat it. That's what you're telling me right That's now. That's not what I'm telling you. I what told are you, you telling me, brother? The bach. It has to be slaughtered. You have How? to cut it. You have to kill it. So that's how? what I said. When you, wait, hold on. When you say how, how? brother, how? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna okay, answer your yes, question. Sir. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Nothing, I'm being disrespectful. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, Elder. There's nothing explicit in text that tells you how to zabach a lamb. If you can find me a scripture that tells me specifically where you're supposed to cut it to kill and slaughter the lamb, I would go ahead and, and, and hold to that because I've slaughtered a lamb before. I, I've slaughtered a lamb before on two occasions for Passover. And no blood came out? Of course. Okay, so what did you do with out. it? So what did you do with it? Nothing. So what did you do with it? I didn't do so nothing what did you with do with blood. It? We let the blood drip out until the lamb died. Once the lamb died, then that's when we roasted it whole afterwards by fire. That ain't and what you said you 10 minutes ago. Passover. You said what? That's not what you said 10 minutes ago because you said that you, you, you roasted it with the blood in it. Okay. So do you realize that if you cut a lamb, uh, even anything, if, somebody, if you cut somebody's juggler or any animal's juggler and it bleeds out, Enough blood is expense where the life runs out of the actual animal. That doesn't mean all the blood has been extinguished out of the animal. There's still blood in the animal. But when you roast it by fire, guess what? The blood is not there anymore. It is either dried up or it is, it's in itself is of no consequential use to that animal because the animal is dead. That's what I'm saying to you. So when you ask me, you have to zabak, you have to slaughter and give it as a sacrifice. Sacrifice just means you're killing the animal for some purpose. And there's a variety of ways of usage for killing that animal. The blood is dripped out until the animal dies. Whatever's remaining in the animal, you don't consume. That's why you have to roast it by fire. That's why the text says the blood is the life force of any animal that you there kill. You correct? Go, brother. Correct? Wait, there wait. You That's go. why you cannot eat. Hold on. That's why you cannot eat anything with the blood in it. What does that mean? Does that mean you have to drain every ounce of blood in anything that you eat? Is that what you're saying? If so, tell me where in scripture that they were able to drain all the blood out. 
of I'm, every okay. animal that they ate. It's okay. impossible. Give me a minute. I'm, give me a minute. Give me one second. I'll show you. Okay. Can, can you give me a second? Okay. Are we going to end off here? Yes. Please show me this. This is going to be the climax of our conversation, and we will transition into the next discussion. Like I said, you're, I'll mute my mic. You're, you're contradicting yourself on, on many points. When you go to Exodus 12, you got to stay in the house, and then you invite people to come out to the house for your Passover. And now you're saying you slaughter the lamb and you roast it with all of its blood in it, but it's been slaughtered. I'm just and nothing about all of its blood. I just told you the blood is drained until the animal is dead, and then you roast it so you are not eating the blood and its form that kept the animal alive, pumping from its heart. You're not eating it in that form anymore once you roast it. That's the purpose of cooking it so you don't have to consume it raw, as the text says, or boiled, but you roast it by fire. I'm, I'm, that, that, I, I'm, I'm sorry, brother. That really doesn't line up with everything do, I'm do reading. You eat meat? Do you eat meat, brother? Well, what I'm, of course, but what I'm saying is. Wait, 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 wait. If you eat meat, do you drain all the blood out of it before you eat it? Okay, eating meat and sacrificing a Passover lamb to Yah is two different things, in my opinion. If I'm eating meat, I'm eating meat. But if I'm sacrificing a Passover lamb to Yah once a year that I've stored up for 15 days, and it's a male without blemish of the first year from the sheep or the goat, that is not a dinner that's not the same because that it's is a that's holy, over, it's, it's what i'm trying to point dinner. out that what, what, what i'm trying to point out is that is a holy act just like the act in, in exodus 12 was a specific holy act in order to stave off the death angel do you just eat the passover eating. lamb after the first passover every time they had the passover afterwards did they eat the lamb sir Say that again. I was trying to find this scripture for sure. you. Sure, I said no because we're about to close out. I'm, what I'm asking yes, you is, did they eat the Passover lamb after the first Passover, like Numbers chapter nine? Did they eat the lamb in Numbers chapter nine? Yes. So the lamb has to be eaten, correct, for Passover? Yes. So how come we don't see anything being eaten in Leviticus chapter one? I'm sorry. Okay, I found the scripture. Now go ahead again. I, I, I had to find that first. Okay, it's sure. in, uh, Leviticus chapter seven. Okay, go ahead, brother. Okay, I'll say it one more time. So what I'm saying is, do you have to eat the Passover lamb according to the instructions that's given? Yes. Okay. When they left out of Egypt, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. Wait. Let, let me stop you. For for sake of clarity, sir. You're not eating the Passover lamb, and neither would I be. You would be. I agree. The memorial. Agree. You would be eating a lamb as a memorial to the Passover. There Correct. Is That's a why I said. Difference no, I agree. Okay. I agree. I agree. Right. I agree. So, so in yes, Numbers sir. chapter nine, mm -hmm. which is not the Passover, but the second Passover as a memorial, did they eat the lamb? That's incorrect because that's the first memorial of Passover, not the second. And the first memorial of Passover after the Passover, did they eat the lamb in Numbers yes. chapter 9? Yes, Brother Devari. And then after they ate the lamb, did they burn the remains? Yes, Brother Devari. So in Leviticus chapter 1, when you're giving an offering, that's a burnt offering, do you mm -hmm. eat any of the lamb? Of course. Where does it say that at in Leviticus chapter 1? That's what I was asking you to show. Okay. Now, what and and what I was asking you to show as well, which you never showed, was what did they do with the blood in Leviticus chapter one? The blood of that lamb was sprinkled on the four horns of Yah's altar. Now I agree. Okay, so that's nothing to do with Passover. But but okay, yes, it does. In my opinion, is because Passover is a burnt sacrifice. And what you're reading in Leviticus chapter 1 is the law of the burnt sacrifice. Do you eat Whether the it be burnt, of the do herd. Eat the, do you eat it? See, if you would have let, let me finish reading, it would have been very I got you. Because, I just asked a question. Because that, is, the, because, that is, because that is 
the law from Yah himself of the burnt sacrifice of the herd, of the flocks, and of the sheep and of the goats. So he laid that law down. So by the time they get to Numbers chapter 1, they already have this understanding that there is a law pertaining to burnt sacrifices. So when they offer up a burnt sacrifices for their very first Passover memorial in Numbers chapter 9, they've been given instructions on what to do with the blood, bro. They're not going to all of a sudden, oh, you know what? We got to do something else with this blood now. Or we, because you, why would he give them instructions in Leviticus chapter 1 of what to do with the blood of the burnt sacrifices? But by the time they get to Leviticus 23, and just because it's Passover, we do something different. That, yes, that's you do. Different. That's what the text says. It's not the same ordinance. Well, but where does it say that? You have what not you read that. That's what because, you Because you never, anywhere you see the word Passover, you never it, see burnt offering. Brother, Passover is a burnt offering. From the very beginning, it was a burnt offering. What? In Exodus 12, is it not a, a lamb of the sheep or the goat, male without blemish, that had to be burnt and roasted? That's called a burnt offering. I don't know what you're missing. But do they eat it after that? Yes. Where in Leviticus chapter 1 are you to eat the animal? He's given. Okay. You're focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on eating when I'm trying to show you that right, there is a it. law of burnt offering. You don't want to deal with that. No, I, it, I, I, I am. That's why I'm going to Leviticus chapter one. That, I'm showing you, if, show me if, you got to eat if, it. If he gives you a law and said, when you offer a burnt offering, this is what you do with it. He didn't say eat it. What you uh, you got to eat it after that. He's already established that this is the law. If it was a burnt offering of a bullock, that's why if you would just read the whole thing, you would see the context, but you wouldn't let me finish. Even go, he even got down to where, what you got to do with the fowls and the meal offering. So you mean to tell me that all changed in Leviticus with Passover? It doesn't make sense. And this is why I keep saying, if you don't, if you go from Exodus 12, my dear brother and sisters, brothers who listen, and if you're still tuning in, if you go from Exodus 12 and skip to Leviticus 23, you don't have no idea what for sweet savor to Yah mean, what a burnt offering mean. You don't have any idea what that means. You're free to make up whatever you make, what you want it to be because why in the world would he go to all of, that's what I said, I still got to read that, what I was going to show you in, in Leviticus 7. Why would he go to all the trouble to give you a whole law on burnt offerings for the herd, burnt offerings for the flock, burnt offerings for the for the fowl and even the meal offering if it changed because of Passover. What what sense does that make, brother? You say that, but you can't prove that they did anything different. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to leave it right here. Even in the New Testament, if you follow that, the most uh, 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 the people in the New Testament always had to go prepare the Passover somewhere which was at the temple during that time before they would eat it. It had to be the blood had to, the blood of the Passover lamb when they did the yearly remorse. The reason they had to go to the temple is because that's where those Levites was, and that's where the altar of burnt sacrifice was, and that's where the blood was spilled, and the priests all threw, sprinkled it on the four horns of the altar. They did that practice thousands of times throughout the book. Thousands from year after year after year. But if you don't read in context and skip, oh, if you go from, like you all do, go from Exodus 12, skip all over the burnt sacrificial, sacrificial laws, so now you can come up with your own way of doing a burnt sacrifice. That's why anybody can do it. You can, you can take the blood of that sacrifice, flush it down the toilet. You can take the blood of that sacrifice, wash it down the drain. You can take the blood of that sacrifice, Matter of fact, like you just said, you ain't even got to drain the blood. Just throw the thing on the grill and cook it up and do whatever you want. But there is a law in Leviticus chapter 1 and in Leviticus 7. I know y'all don't want to read that about the law of the birth sacrifice. And it's one thing to not know, but it's, a totally, it's a totally different when you just totally ignore it. So can I, I want to answer that question real quick. And I appreciate you taking this time. I know it's late and I'm a little elevated. That's mostly out of just, I've been up since, I don't know, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., but 
Uh, can I please uh, read something about uh, blood? Yeah, please, 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 please close out, and then yes. we're gonna end the show. Okay. Uh, let's see if I'm in the right place. Hopefully. Um, let me see if I'm in the right place here. Okay, I'm gonna start. Uh, it's in Leviticus ch uh, chapter 7. This is not exactly what I wanted to read, but uh, I really want to read uh, Leviticus 1 and follow it up with this, but uh, it's actually in Leviticus chapter 6. It says uh, in verse 18, All the males among the children of Israel shall eat of it. It shall be a statue forever in your generations concerning the offerings of Yah made by fire. When you're offering up a sacrifice of Passover, it is an offering made by fire because, I mean, there's no other way to offer a Passover lamb unless it's by fire. That's from the very inception of Passover. Of a, I, I, mean, I just don't know what people are missing. Anyway, everyone, okay. Uh, this is definitely not the passage that I want to read. So uh, I had my finger on it a minute ago. Uh, well, give me a second here. I went through so much, but uh, you, you do realize that that passage is talking about a grain offering, right? Well, yeah, okay, so let's deal with that then. I'm gonna go back. Oh, no, 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 just find the passage. No, I'm just saying, just find the passage you're looking for and let's close out on that passage. What is what is just paraphrase it so I can help you look for it? Well, the most high is basically saying that any man that mm -hmm. um, um, sacrifice a lamb or goat bullock or whatever and didn't bring it to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation for the blood of that sacrifice to be given to the priest and splashed upon the four horns of the burnt, altar burn sacrifice that soul would be cut off from among his people so there was there's a lot of and this all throughout the book of leviticus before you get to um leviticus 23 that the blood is of a of a burnt sacrifice is a holy thing. I mean, even with the first Passover in Exodus 12, the blood is what saved him. That's why they're getting all of the blood of Yahshua in the New Testament of the passing over your sins and all that. You can, no one is going to ever tell somebody like me that a blood sacrifice of a lamb, that the blood is not holy and that the blood is not supposed to be treated a certain way, but you could just do anything with it. There is a law pertaining to that, and it ain't coming from me. It's coming from Leviticus chapter one and the other chapters. Do, do you Leviticus. see the screen that I have? Uh, Leviticus 17? 17, that might be it. I think yes, you that is, a that, point that's there, exactly bro. what you're looking for. Yes. Thank you. I thought it was seven or something. You're welcome. Oh, my eyesight yeah, I told you I'm on your side, brother. I'm, I, here to help. I'm, I'm on your side too, brother. I, I need a brother <laughs> like you on my side. I need all y'all. Oh man. man, yeah, I got you. I, you okay. know, you know, uh, mm -hmm. point. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, well, okay, okay, there you go. Okay, and I'm uh, verse uh, chapter 17, verse one. And the Most High Yah spoke unto Moses, saying, speaking to Aaron and unto his sons and unto all the children of Israel, saying unto them, This is the thing which Yah has commanded. One thing I one thing I, I just want to point out, brother, everything I was reading in Leviticus 1, uh, 1 and here in 17 and in Exodus, this came straight from the mouth of Yah himself. So uh, it's very seldom you're going to see that the Most High contradicted himself. Uh, now, here we are in verse 3, uh, Leviticus 17 and verse 3. What man soever there be of the house of Israel that kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or that kills it out the camp. So that covers anywhere in the world, right? If you're in the camp uh, during this time in Leviticus, when they're in the wilderness, if they killed an ox or lamb or go in that camp or outside the camp, that means anywhere, right? And you, and verse four, and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto Yah before the tabernacle of Yah, blood shall be imputed unto that man he has shed blood, that man shall be cut off from among his people. The shedding of blood for a sacrifice, if it wasn't treated in a certain way, got them 
cut off from among the people, which is a death sentence. I mean, you know, you're out there in the wilderness, you get cut off. You ain't, you had no protection with y'all. I mean, uh, you might get drugged back to Egypt by the Egyptians or something. But anyway, or the wild beasts of the field might get you or get sold into slavery by them Midianites or something. Uh, verse five, to the end that the, no, verse five, to the end that the children of Israel must bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto Yah, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. At this time, there's over 23, 24,000 Levites that stood at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service of Yah, to catch that blood, to have it offered at his altar. Um, unto the priest, an offer for a peace offering unto Yah. And the priest shall, verse 6, and the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Yah, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Yah. You, you, uh, the reference of a sweet savor unto Yah is mentioned uh, several times in Leviticus 23. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone a whoring. This, okay, we talk about forever. Now, if forever still means forever, in verse 7 it says, This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. And that is talking about sacrifices of animals, what is done with the blood. Does it say specifically there? Sir? Does it say does it say specifically there? I don't know if you can hear me. Does okay. it say specifically there in Leviticus 17 what to do with that blood? It says, uh, in, in verse six, uh, it says, uh, and the priest shall throw the blood six. on the altar of the Lord. Yes, because this has been reiterate, reiterated from uh, Leviticus chapter one that the priest takes the blood in verse six here in 17. The priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Yah at the door of the tabernacle of, of the congregation. So in Leviticus okay. chapter one, there's four horns that. Uh, I agree. That, oh, okay, and they had to sprinkle that blood in order I for agree. it to be a sweet savor and accepted before Yah. You I could agree. just take that blood and do whatever you wanted, or it wasn't accepted, and that was the I goal agree. of whatever we offer to be accepted. But Passover is not being offered to the priests. Um, but anyway, so look in Leviticus 17, there are some things in context we have to keep in mind, right? Do you see verse seven? Can you exegete that for us? Verse seven. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone a whore. Wait, slow down right there. So to prevent them from doing this, this is why this ordinance is given in regards to sacrifices. But guess what? There's a very interesting word there in verse 5. It says, peace offerings. Is that a burnt offering? The same, the peace offering, same thing as a burnt offering? Verse 5, to the end of children offering a sacrifice. Where, where are you? Okay. Verse 5, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, their sacrifices. They had burnt sacrifices, meal offerings. They had peace offerings. This specifically says sacrifices. And the, the, the very meaning of the word, uh, let me set this down. For a the very meaning of the word Passover itself means sacrificial lamb, a lamb that is sacrificed. That's not what Passover means, Elder. I think we went over that. What does it mean? It means to pass over. <laughs> it literally means to pass over, to skip over. That's what it means. Okay. It doesn't so, mean sacrifice. So what is done with the animal that allowed you a person to be skipped over? It was sacrificed. Yeah, the animal was killed. Correct. And the blood from that animal was utilized for them to be skipped over on the Passover. Right? So I agree with that. Okay. But so, you also ate that lamb too. Like it was dinner. You roasted it with matzah and some bitter herbs and you had a whole meal with it before you even burn the rest of the amains so that you can't consume it. A burnt offering is consumed whole and you never eat it. Nobody eats a burnt offering. But you can't eat a Passover. So how can you eat the Passover if it's a burnt offering? When there's no instruction that it can be done with a burnt offering. And in verse 17, in chapter 17, this is referring to two things. Peace offering. In verse 4, it even says, offer it as a gift. As a gift. That's the first thing. 
In verse 6, it says, uh, excuse me, verse 5, it says peace offering. In verse 7, it was to deter them from giving their sacrifices to goat demons, which they were sacrificed. They was whoring after mm -hmm. these demons, and they were doing the wrong thing. So to deter them from doing that, it says, hey, if you're going to make a sacrifice, because, again, they were sacrificing to goat demons, which means they wasn't even keeping the commandments. Hey, you gotta you gotta sacrifice it here where the priest can officiate over it. The priest mm -hmm. can can watch and look over while you do it to make sure you're not doing it after a different type of deity. Because where they was at in the wilderness, Azazel is a goat, is considered a goat deity, right? Because a goat is given to him in Leviticus 16, which is the one right before this, which again, which is very interesting, is read it in context because the original scroll did not have the visions and chapters and all of that. But if you read the previous chapter, it talks about a goat given to Azazel, who is a wilderness deity that is represented by the mountain goat. And what the Israelites started doing was started offering their sacrifices to this goat deity, Azazel. This is why verse chapter 17 is written to deter them from doing that. This is why the larger context is very important to understand the context for any minute passage that we read. So if you take it out of context, like Leviticus 17, without accounting for chapter 16, then of course it may say what you want it to say, but there's a context. This has to do with offering a gift, a peace offering. Nowhere does it say the word burnt offering here. And that is to deter them in verse 7 from offering their sacrifices to goat demons because everything now can be officiated by the priesthood. Correct. No. This is the detriment. Okay. Oops. And then, okay, I'm gonna let you end off with this last oh, point. Yeah, I know we, we really can go, have to go on to the break of and all that. But I, I was just referring to something in Numbers, where in Numbers, when they're uh, we're going back to Numbers chapter nine, real quick, it says, um, verse seven. Uh, wait a minute, um, hold on a second, I just had my hand on it. Uh, okay, so. Okay, yeah, it's verse 7. It says, well, I'm going to start at verse 6 real quick. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moshe and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, we are defiled by the dead body of a man. Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering of Yah in his appointed season among the children of Israel? The offering that they're offering is a Passover lamb, correct? In this passage. That's what, what this passage, is their, what, wait, what passage is that? Okay, I'm referring to Numbers chapter 9, which a lot of people definitely read out of context because... No, I read that earlier. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think that this is an example of the Most High telling them that they could keep Passover anywhere in the world when it's actually the exact opposite where he's telling them that you must keep it in this one place. This is the main concern with the men that are defiled by reason of a dead body. They are trying to come and present their Passover offering at the door of the tabernacle, and they're, to be, they're being kept back because they're unclean. This is the very first memorial of Passover. So you had to bring the offering. Now, the offering if it's Passover and you're talking about bringing an offering somewhere, it had to have been a lamb or a goat that they're referring to in this passage right here. For a Passover, yes. Yes? For, yes. But for a burnt offering, you can also add a bull or a bird. Correct. Or a meal offering. Correct? You're talking about grain, but that's, that's a different offering. That's if you don't have those uh, previous offerings. Right, and even in Leviticus chapter 10, it talks about the, the meal and the grain offerings. But Correct. here, the offering would be a lamb or a goat of the first year for Passover, because this topic is talking about bringing an offering for Passover, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so then in, that, in this instance, the offering that's being presented to be burnt for Passover would be a lamb, which would be eaten by the person that brought it, correct? After it was burnt. Correct. 
Okay. So. Well, not burnt, but roasted. It's two different words. Uh, you can't roast something without burning it, dear brother. Yeah, but a burnt offering is a different word than roasting the lamb. Because the intention is different. You roast it so you can eat it. You burn it so you cannot eat it. Okay. Now, the okay, I, I will give you that. Now, that is correct. But also, the offerings that are brought had to be brought to the priest. In this instance, this is an instance of an offering of a lamb being brought to the priest, correct? Yes or no? I mean, right? Talking about in the in Numbers chapter 9? Numbers chapter 9, verse 7. The two men are defiled by a dead body, and they're trying to bring their offering, and they're being kept back. And they're saying, why are we being kept back? And they say, well, let's... Wait, 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 wait. Leviticus chapter 9, you said? That's what you said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so Leviticus chapter 9. We're going to go back down to that verse. And this is verse um, seven. Seven. You must draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering. What is this? This is Leviticus chapter nine? I'm sorry. I said number. Uh, it's actually numbers nine. Uh, oh, numbers chapter nine. Okay. Numbers chapter nine. Right. And it says, uh, why are we keep from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointing time among the people of Israel? That's the point I wanted to bring up. They're bringing an okay. offering. That offering, if we, this is pertaining to the very first memorial of Passover, a year after they've come out of Egypt, exactly 12 moons later, they're keeping the very first memorial of Passover, and they want to bring an offering to Yah's priest at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. for some no, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say all of that at the door of the tent. of the. Where does it say all of that at? In Leviticus. That. It says that in Leviticus chapter 1. Oh, okay. Going back to one, I'm saying in Numbers nine is that is that mentioned there? Well, that all that's of what the, they're doing. Well, that's why you have to read in context. All of the see, if you read that in seventeen, it shows you you couldn't sacrifice an offering anywhere else but at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. You couldn't. You couldn't. Okay. You okay? Give me one. Okay, I, I know. No, this, 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 yeah, I this, this close out right now. I'm gonna close out. I'm gonna close out. I'm gonna close out okay. with uh, the, uh, 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 Leviticus chapter 17. And if the Most High's will, I could uh, follow up with you at a later date. And uh, um, and I know it's getting late, but I, it's never too late for me to. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna go back to Leviticus 17. To, to show that all of the offerings were brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and they were presented to all of them. I don't care what offering you're talking about. If it was an offering to Yah, it had to go to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to be presented to Yah and accepted by Yah by a process of it going through the priest. So in other words, if you slaughtered it, you had to slaughter, they had to slaughter it in front of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, in front of Yah's peace, a uh, priest who would therefore catch that blood and sprinkle it on that altar so that it would be accepted. That's what we're reading about in Leviticus 23. So in uh, uh, in uh, um, Leviticus chapter 17 again, uh, the reason, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to start at verse 8, well, verse 7 where we left off. And uh, Leviticus 17 and 7, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have done a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And you shall say unto them, whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among you that offer a burnt offering or sacrifice. And brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of, con of the congregation to offer it unto Yah, even that man shall be cut off among his people. So all of the offerings and the burnt sacrifices had to be brought to Yah's priest, and, and it had to be done. You couldn't sacrifice that in your house like Egypt you, during this period of memorial of Passover, as you were seeing in Numbers chapter 9, the very first memorial of Passover, they're commanded to go somewhere. Whereas in Egypt, they were commanded to stay in the house. So the memorials are 
uh, that's why they had the pilgrimage festivals later on. You had to go to one place. So here is an, uh, an example of the burnt offerings. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Um, verse 8. And you shall say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or the strangers which sojourn among you that offereth a burnt offering, or a sacrifice, which the Passover is a sacrificial burnt offering, or and brings it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, for it to be offered unto Yah, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. So you all they always have to go to one place. Is that's some significant there. But also we're dealing with the blood in verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eats any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourn among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. So here is separating what is to be done with blood, a uh, uh, food that is, when you're eating a meal that you have hunted and caught, you they poured that blood out on the to the dust. But when it came to a sacrifice, that blood was always presented to the priest to be All offered right, so to God. And uh, um, was that the first, final passage you want to close out with? Yes, sir. Uh, for it is the life of the flesh, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life of it. Therefore, I say unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth shall be cut off. And every soul that eats, uh, well, that's talking about uh, which dies of itself, was turned, torn by beasts. Uh, whether it be of your own country, or I got you, I got you. So, okay. so is the Passover lamb an atonement sacrifice? No, but okay, it is you. a uh -huh. it, it is according to verse, um, no, but it is okay. Verse 8 of 17, what the Most High is saying here that, and you shall say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers which sojourn among you that offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice offering and bring it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So why is it important that they bring the burnt offerings and the other offerings that are to be sacrificed to the door of the con tabernacle of the congregation? Because, because you're not to eat any of it. it. Sir? Because you're not to consume any of it. Right, and the because there was something that had to be done with the blood. That's what this is gotcha. talking about. I got the you. Blood had to be placed up upon the altar of burnt sacrifice. So, if we're referring to Passover as a burnt offering or as just a regular offering, it still had to be brought somewhere. That's what they're dealing with in Numbers chapter nine. So, when they brought it somewhere. Even though you're saying that they didn't say nothing about eating, obviously it goes without saying in Numbers chapter 9, they're bringing an offering to Yah for it to be sacrificed. And of course, if it's Passover later on, they ate it. But burnt all things according to Leviticus chapter 1 is not eaten, correct? In Leviticus chapter 1, it doesn't say eat it, but okay. it says it's a burnt offering that where the blood of that offering was to be sprinkled on the four horns of the altar. But here in Numbers chapter 9, like I said, when I was talking about the contradictions that you were stating earlier, if they were offered during this period and they're talking about an offering for Passover, that offering had to be taken somewhere. Wasn't in the house where you just do what you want. It was taken to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and they slaughtered, slaughtered that animal, that lamb or goat, 
that they stored up for Passover memorial in front of Yah's priest. Now, gotcha. when I started off, I was just, I was focused on what did the most high command to be done with the blood of the yearly memorial Passover sacrifice. And here it is right here. It was brought in Numbers chapter nine to the priest and that blood was sprinkled upon the four horns of it the said, altar. It says that in Numbers chapter nine? It says it right here because Where does it it's, say that that was happening. Where's well, where that in Numbers chapter nine? Well, it that's why I say if you go back to Leviticus chapter one, you you uh -huh. see what's taking place. It's sprinkled upon. What other reason are they taking it to the priest? <laughs> I mean, and, they're taking and, it. And, they're and taking it to the priest because it has to. No, that's how not, it's all. And not to, taking it to the priest, they're bringing a concern to Moses to say we've been unclean for touching a dead body. Therefore, we can't do our Passover sacrifice. So what should we do? They're not giving it to the priest to perform or officiate no act on their behalf. They're just concerned that they cannot sacrifice their Passover because they are unclean for touching a dead body. That's the context, right? No, no. Totally disagree, and I'll tell you why. Because it also Let this be the last about... point, Elder. Go ahead. Because it all, see, if, if you left it right there, it would mean that. But see, you have to read in its context. Now, watch this. In Numbers chapter 9, I'll show you exact. Okay, now, let's see if this makes sense. Let's see if this makes any sense. Let me go back real quick. Uh, last me, point, last and, point. I, I, okay, I'm I promise. This yes. For the night, yeah, I'm about, okay. In Numbers chapter 9, it says, verse 10, speaking to the Jewish children of Israel, say, if any man of you or your future generations, which is what posterity means, shall be unclean by reason of, of a dead body. Now look at the part he throws in. Or be on a journey of far off. Now, remember when I was on your program the very first time and you never answered this question the first time. It says, or you be on a journey of far off. I asked you specifically, on a journey far off away from what? If you're on a journey far off, you're far off away from something. You're far off away from your home, far off away from where you park your car. You're far off away from where you go to school. You're far off away from something. What are they far off away from in, in Numbers chapter 9, verse 10, that they can't keep the pass over the first month? What are they far off away from in Numbers chapter 9, verse 10, that forbids them from keeping Passover in the first month? They're far off away from something, so they can't keep it. That's very obvious. It's something that they're far off away from that is forbidding them from keeping the memorial of Passover. And in, in, in Numbers chapter month. nine, there was there was they touched the dead body. No, that's dealing with uncleanliness. That's one thing. But then he talks about when you are on. See these people that's unclean. They're not on no journey far off. They're right there. The he 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 deals with them and then he deals with another topic so correct he, i agree but that's okay. future that's future right tent. so now what am so now what is it that they are far off away from that would prevent them from keeping the passover in the first month and i asked that question a thousand times people avoid it never answer it and i'm still asking it what would they have been far off away from that prevented them to keep the Passover in the Pesach in the first month? I don't know. Every every scenario would be different. Well, I do know. And the and what prevented them from and, and, and if you read, it's gonna tell you. Watch. The thing that prevented them, the thing that would prevent them from keeping the Passover in the first month. If they were on a journey of far off, is that in order to keep the Passover in the first month, they had to be in the place where the offerings were brought. That's the same dilemma that the men who are unclean are facing. They're trying to bring the offering. They can't bring it. If you're on a far off journey, you can't bring it because you're far away. So now that they're far away, they can't bring their offering. That's a concern. Now watch, if you continue reading real uh, quickly, I'm uh, speaking to, uh, verse 10, speaking to the children of Israel, saying, if any man of you 
or of your future generation shall be unclean for reason of a dead body or be in a journey far off, yet you shall keep the Passover unto Yah. So, enough, so you're, on a, you, you're on a far off journey away from something in the first month. So now you got to keep it the second month. So obviously you were far off away some, from something in that first month where you couldn't keep it that first month. You had to wait to the second month to keep it. Now watch. The 14th day of the second month at even, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning nor break any bone of it and according to all of the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. Now check this out. But the man that is clean, so you clean, and you are not in a journey, and you neglect to keep the Passover, even that same soul shall be cut off from among his people, because here's the answer right here. Because he brought not the offering unto Yah. The only time you can bring, if you're talking about the wilderness, the place where you had to bring the offering is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So that null and voids all of that keeping the Passover anywhere in the world mess right there. Because okay. the only way you could do it, you had to bring the offering to the door. Of, he didn't have a door to the tabernacle of the congregation all over the world. It was in one place at his house. So they had to be there to keep the Passover and bring the offering. If you were unclean, you couldn't approach because you're in your uncleanness. And if you on a, on a journey of far off, you couldn't bring it because you're too far away. And some of the reasons that if you read, some of the reasons that people were on the journey because during the wilderness period, Moses was and Joshua would send spies out to spy out the land before they would conquer. They would conquer it, so you wouldn't bring the whole camp, you know, the whole Israelite community right at the doorstep of the enemy to spy out the land. You would send spies out, and they would be on the journey spying out the land. So they may miss being at the door of the tabernacle during that time. But gotcha. he, they would have they would have thirty days to come back. But this is definitely proven. To one thing without a shadow of a doubt. In order to keep the memorial of Passover, you had to keep it at one place by bringing an offering to that one door of the tabernacle of the congregation where the Levites would catch the blood of your sacrifice and offer it up to Yah. There is no such evidence that they. this is telling them keep Passover anywhere in the world. It doesn't make sense. Because if you are on a journey anywhere in the world, then you should be able to keep it in the first month. If you in Spain, keep it in Spain in the first month. If you in Timbuktu, keep it in Timbuktu in the first month. So if you on a journey and you can't keep it in the first month, that means you had to be somewhere that first month to keep it. And this is telling you, you had to be at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to present your offering in the first month. But if you couldn't do it for some reason, he gave you an, ex an extra month to come back and do it the second month. And we saw examples of that when, uh, 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 was it King Hezekiah ordained a second uh, feast in the Passover the second month? That's all that means. It doesn't mean, oh, keep it anywhere in the world. That doesn't even make sense. If you keep it anywhere in the world, then you ain't on no journey. It don't matter. So, um, I appreciate your time, brother. Uh, I don't even know what time. It, oh my goodness! Uh, but um, uh, I'm, uh, oh wow, what is that? Is that my hand? Oh, anyway, yes, sir. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna leave it there. If you wanna, uh, if you wanna uh, comment on what I just said, I would like to hear your uh, remarks on. Does that? Do you agree with? Um, that Passover had to be in the first month had to be kept whether at the place where they brought the offering because again I've never heard anyone answer that question when I said well when I asked the question when they say that they're on a journey of far off I'm asking the question for the final time 
far off away from what that they can't keep pass over in the first month. Whatever's going on with them at that time. So um, I really don't, I really can't get into specifics right now because there are scriptural references that I can give in regards to that. Right. One of them being during times of war, right. When they're not local to keep the Passover, that they're somewhere else um, going through warfare. They're unable to come right back immediately and keep the Passover. So they're giving some extra time in their travels to come back in the second month and to keep Passover, right? But nonetheless, I'm going to close out. And again, we can continue this um, sometime next week. I appreciate your your um, presence here. Elder, as always, thank you for being respectful, even though we disagreed on certain points. Um, there were some points that we did agree on. I'm going to yes, meditate sir. on some of the things that you did share. And hopefully thank you man. do the same. Yep. Thank you. I will. I want you to get Yep, I want you to get some rest, get some sleep, since you got to get up in the morning, just like oh, I do. Oh, I'm off tomorrow, bro. Well, I'm not. <laughs> so let me go get some sleep. Let me go ahead and get some rest. No, you, no, you good. You good. I honestly thought it was Friday night. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, it's, it's I, good. Honestly, it's I, I kind of did for a second, too, and then I realized um, that I'm receiving a, a, a email from my job about something to do in the morning. Oh my so. God. I'm sorry, bro. Now you good. So I appreciate your time, Elda. You know, thank you so much for it. Thank you for sharing. Like you always do. Thank you for being respectful. Right. Cause I appreciate that. Even in disagreement, you're still my brother and that will never change. Despite the nuances that we disagree on, I would say to you, keep Yah's commandments and follow his, his son's teaching and example in Yeshua and then everything will be okay, right? We may not be able to get it all right now, but when that time comes, you know, on the return of the Davidic king, he's going to bring every gather everything together. So if we do have to even cast, keep Passover then, at least we'll be all together, right? Amen. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that's for gotcha. real, bro. We're still gotcha. in the same boat, pot, pan, or whatever they call it. Either way, so thank you. Have a good night. I apologize for keep it. You up? I didn't even know you were on. I just happened to browse through the channels when I got in. So I know you get you. Uh Brother, I love you, and I, I apologize for my uh, disrespectful. No, you didn't disrespect uh, me. I could, I, didn't... I could go off the handle sometimes. Oh no, no. Listen, I like that fiery passion is good because that's how we express ourselves. I know that's your part of your personality, so it doesn't bother me at all. I had fun. It's just that I wish I had more time, and I just unfortunately don't have it this morning now that we're in the morning time that's all Good. Good so yeah get, get some rest and um again if you can catch me on next week and you know maybe tuesday wednesday sometime and next friday feel free to jump on and you then you know the floor is yours as always okay yes sir thank you good night peace and love and blessings uh good night sir same to you all right so let me go on and close out thank you family for um Joining in with us and up at 3.40 a.m. in the morning um, and rocking out with us almost five hours, right? I truly appreciate your sacrifice for being up in this morning. We had almost 100 people in here at 3 in the morning. So all praise to the most high. This is not what I want to do, do these sessions late at night like this. I prefer to do them early in the evening. So I'm trying to work some things out with my schedule so that I will continue to do that for you guys. Again, no Freestyle Friday today. Now that today's Friday. Uh, simply because I'm going to have uh, family come into town. So I'm not going to, you know, jump on, you know, live and I have guests, right? That's why I decided to go live on Thursday evening to give you guys something to eat, which you can definitely, this is almost five hours of meal that you can eat on uh, until our next live stream, okay? So again, take everything point by point, uh, take everything slowly. Um, also, we got classes on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time sharp. We're going over the grammatical lexical analysis and our seven step inductive research process. Um, and we're doing we're dealing with number one. We, we started part one of the first grammatical lexical analysis. We're going to close off with that um, in our part two of the same analysis. Um, and once we do that, then we're going to move on to the next step and the next step and the next step. But pretty much what we're doing is whenever there's conflicts like this. There are several things, methods that you have to approach the text with and steps to take to actually decipher what it is that you're reading. And the seven step method that I provide gives you the most thorough approach to deciphering any text than anything I found within our community. Right. And that's my gift to you with my 12 plus years, uh, almost 15 years of research and study. 
um, whether it's the academic route or whether it's the going to conferences route or whether it's just personal reading, interviewing with scholars, et cetera, uh, reading the word, praying and meditating, right? The proper way, the biblically ascribed way to meditate and pray. Um, and all those things have allowed me to give my final, um, I would say, gift to offer to the community in regards to these classes. So if you want to get past difficult topics like this, sign up for the class. I'll give you all the methods, resources, and tools necessary so you can do your own study and let no man deceive you. All right. So much love to you, family. Thank you for rocking out with me. I love you. Peace and shalom. I'm going to get some sleep. <laughs> Whatever I can get. All right. Shalom, shalom, family.